Okay, everybody, it's uh, just gone past 4 p.m. and I was hoping that uh, most people would have logged on by now and um, kind of conscious of time as well. Can I just ask everybody to mute and, and uh, would um, rather I can mute everybody actually. I hope everyone can still hear me, okay. Um, right, I, uh, okay, I, I think we should just start whilst we um, continue to admit people as others join us. Um, which is going to be a bit um, challenging, but we'll, we'll make it happen. I was hoping that more, a lot more people would have joined us by now, but um, they haven't. And I think maybe we should um, just just kickstart something and go around and do some introductions. Uh, obviously, my name is Henry Coley. I'm the um, General Secretary of Canuc. I'm also a member of PAC who are organizing this event. And uh, I also have here with me, Dr. Bobadjo Klaus, he's on, he's on the call, he's on the conference, he's the chair of Canuc. And I'm going to invite Dr. Bobadjo Klaus to um, say one or two things to welcome everybody. And then um, we'll kick start from there. Dr. Bobadjo Klaus, if you can just unmute yourself, please. Brilliant. Thank you, Mazi um, uh, Koli. Uh, thank you so much. Wow, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, you're welcome to a grand event. Um, you know, we, we're so proud of PAC. Uh, PAC are the, the professionals in accounting and commerce. They are a, a strong um, member organization of, of CANUC. CANUC is the central association of Nigerians in the United Kingdom. That is the umbrella body of all Nigerians in the United Kingdom. And sincerely, anything about youth, it's uh, uh, very high up on, 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 on our agenda. And uh, so we're so pleased that uh, PAC had picked this up. And, you know, we're here today to uh, discuss issues, you know, um, regarding, you know, bringing uh, our, 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 our young men and our women into work, encouraging them and uh, mentoring them. So this is a, a beautiful event. Um, sincerely, the kind of people I'm seeing here, uh, they can move mountains. So I think the youths are, are so, I mean, they, I hope that they are going to, you know, log on to this program and enjoy themselves and be empowered. So you're all, all very welcome. I uh, thank you all so much for those who, uh, who've come on board and I appreciate you all. I appreciate PAC for what they've put together. So thank you so much. You're very welcome. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Douglas. Um, whilst I continue to admit people, I would also like to recognize um, Dr. Gwinga Koka, who is also a member, a founding member of PAC, actually. Um, unfortunately, the PAC chair is not here at the moment. So, Dr. Koka, I don't know if you want to say one or two things before we uh, get start, and maybe whilst you're preparing yourself, um, I'd like to thank um, some of our major sponsors. We have uh, the likes of uh, Pastor uh doing who helped who paid for the flyer and helped with the design and organizing uh the fly the fly itself and then also uh dr dio lomo who has helped us with setting up the uh it systems and and um zoom to get this going so dr cook i don't know if you want to say one or two things about pack before we proceed you're muted dr cook are you mute yeah dr. welcome everyone um yeah, this is a very important program. Uh, the professional in accounting and practice is an association of accountants and entrepreneurs in our community who are interested in um, creating a platform to encourage other people, to support people coming into the profession. Uh, we have particular focus on the young people to mentor them into getting into the profession and for people, young entrepreneurs who are just setting up and they need support and advice and mentoring, that's what we are for. And our membership is drawn not only from the Nigerian community, but from mainly African professionals in the UK. So um, we welcome anyone who is interested in these areas to join us. Um, thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you once again, Dr. Koka. Um, so generally what's going to happen is that we're going to have a number of people talk to us about 
career, the engagement and how, how we can capture our youth and how we can inspire them and how we can move on to uh, move them on to careers and help them man manage their careers. And the order of presentation is that generally we're going to have all the speakers talk and then at the end of that we're going to question and answer. So if any, anybody has a question, they want to ask anybody, uh, please just make a note of it, make reference to the uh, uh, maybe point at, at which that question came to your mind during the presentation and then we'll take it from there. Um, but in terms of proceeding, we're going to go in according to the order of the flyer. And I'm hoping that everybody has, has seen a copy of the flyer and uh, the very first person on the flyer is Councillor Kate. She has some things to, to uh, share with us and then um, we'll move on uh, accordingly. So at uh, this point, Councillor Kate, if you're ready to kick start, I would uh, hand the microphone over to you. Uh, I think you'll be speaking to us for like uh, 15 to 20 minutes. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. You know, I think first of all, I have to say I'm very honored to be invited to be one of the speakers, you know, in this uh, organization and obviously the conference, which, you know, touches young people. And uh, for me, young people is always what I'm always talking about. I don't know, maybe because they are our future, but I also our future leaders, but I also look at it the way that they, that it, things are much harder for them than it has been for us. Because after what I felt that was hard for me, what the young people are seeing now makes it even, you know, for me, makes my life actually that I've just sailed through without any hitch. You know, hence, you know, I like anything to do with the young people. I'm very pleased and I'm so happy that I'm, um, you know, part of this. I think you know, sometimes it's always important for people to tell their story because uh, it is through stories that one can pick up, you know, certain things, you know, and through stories, one can influence someone, you can impact someone and you can inspire someone. And I think with those three headings, I feel like, yes, I think I've got something for the young people. And first of all, I have to say for those who don't know me, I'm popularly known as Auntie Kate, which I actually prefer to be called, you know, Auntie Kate. And um, I'm one of seven, you know, and uh, out of the 75 boys, I always have um, a, a very soft spot for my dad because, um, when we were growing up, you know, it was said that um, it's not necessary, her friend, his friend said it's not necessary to train the girls because he's got five boys, he should concentrate on the boys. But my father said, no, you know, I would like to treat them all the same equal. So I look at it and I thought to myself, while we're talking about gender equality now, think about in the fifties when my father, you know, actually believed in gender equality. So that's amazing, fantastic. And that's really, you know, why, you know, I think that uh, when we talk about uh, gender equality, we said that men don't, don't um, recognize, you know, the power of women, but well, some of them do. And that, so I do not like to generalize. Hence, I was, you know, given that opportunity to study and I studied and then, um, well, came the civil war, which obviously brought me, brought my studies to a stop in a way. However, I still continued, you know, my father wanted me to be a nurse, and when I got married, you know, I married very early, which was arranged marriage, you know, hence, yes, you know, sometimes we don't know the journey that people have gone through. You so say it was an arranged marriage and I came over here, didn't know who I was meeting. However, my parents know who they are because uh, they are friends that have grown up, you know, so his uncle wants to, his, um, uh, my daddy's uncle, uh, my daddy's friend, the nephew wants to get married and then there you are this young girl that is growing up I think it's gonna be a good one anyway I ended up in London here in very very early 70s you know with my certificate which was just half because obviously I didn't finish my uh, course which um, was a uh, training I went to teacher's training you know and I didn't finish that but um I had a very 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 strong basic education that even when I came here my first exam I just fly and pass that right through so I didn't have any problem you know so I came here the, the first year I came here 71 by 72 I was into nursing you know doing um, my nursing training because that's what my daddy wanted me to do my daddy wanted me to be a nurse and that's what I did 
And then while I was doing that, I was also having been a mother as well. So really, I, nothing was left behind. Everything was done together. So I like to uh, emphasize on that because sometimes people think you have to do one thing and leave it and then start another one. Time is going, you know, so you really have to think about, you know, doing quite a few things. And that, that's why, you know, for women, we are very, very good at multitasking. And I was able to, you know, multitask and I really enjoyed doing that because I can see that things are moving very well for me. Well, within three years, I came to this country. I got my general nursing certificate. By the time I was four, year, four years into the country, I got my midwifery as well. So within the time I got my midwifery, my general certificate, I've already got two children. So, you know, you can see I'm being a mother, being a wife, a husband, a wife, and being, you know, in a professional. So I don't, it didn't let anything go. While I was working, by the time I know it, I've got four children. But on one darkest day, I call it a one darkest day, I found myself alone. I found myself alone because my husband passed on. So I was left with four children. The youngest being 18 months old, five year old, nine year old, 12 year old. Now, you would have thought, what is she going to do? I don't have my mother, I don't have my auntie, nobody here, except friends. But you know what? I made good friends. And I've always said that a friend indeed is a friend in need. Those are the friends that I never forget because those are the ones that help me while I'm pursuing. I'm still pursuing what I wanted to do. You know, although I'm a midwife, a state registered nurse, I still believe I haven't achieved yet. And I was left with four children. You would have thought, yes, let her concentrate. No, I actually wanted to be a lawyer, you know, and I thought, how can I do that? I got four children. And, but the thing is this, always believe that you can and always believe in yourself. Be determined. And once you're determined, you believe in yourself and you have trust in yourself, time management, discipline. Those are the things that will help you to achieve whatever you want to do. It's when you have that 1% negativity. It annoys your 99% positiveness, I'm telling you. You see, it's like you, you trust yourself, you love yourself, and then you have one doubt. That doubt takes over. So always be positive about yourself. So I remain positive and looking straight and say, this is what I want. But the main thing is how to plan it. And one thing I always said, wherever you're working, make sure that you are reliable, you go to work on time and you make sure that you have a good atmosphere because my manager, without her being the way I behave at work, I wouldn't have got help because I went and uh, with her and I said, I still want to maintain working full time, but I need also to look after my children. What do I do? And she said to me, what do you want? I said, can you work the off duty so that I be able to come to work? I be able to take them to school and pick them up from school. So all these things were done for me. And it's because of my relationship with the people I work with. I worked at North Middlesex for 40 years. And out of the whole 40 years, never for one day did I have any query. Never for one day. Because it's the way you portray yourself and the way you treat others and your, the people that you're looking after and the people you are working with. And that has helped me. But as you know what, I work in doing that work, but within me, I feel I haven't really achieved what I wanted. And they said, what is it that you want? I've always wanted to be a lawyer. And I thought, yes, but how am I gonna do it with, her, with four children? I gave time when the little one was eight, eight years old, then he, she can, you know, jump on the bus and so forth. I thought, yes, I'm going to not apply. Hence, I applied at uh, Middlesex University, uh, University, you know, I mean, North, North London University, um, University. I applied there. I got through because I'm a mature student. However, I was called by the lecturers and said, well, Mrs. Anolo, you've got four children, you're working full time, and you're a widow. How do you think you can cope? Do you know that? Law degree is the highest of the, all the degrees. I say, yes, I can. So really, whenever I, when I heard Obama said, yes, I can, I said, ah, I know your case. I've already said it long ago. Yes, I can. And that is very, very important because you must believe in yourself. Don't make any doubt. And they said to me, now you got to have two weeks. Go, have, go home, think about it. Two weeks time, get back to us. In two weeks time, they rang me again and said to me to come. And uh, when I got there, they said, now, what do you think? Are you sure that you can do this? I said, yes, I remain where I am. I'm going to be, I'm going to do that. And they said, well, you know, 
the space is yours. I took that, it's supposed to be five years part time, but I did it in four years. Why? Because one year is, they've taken one year as because I've got other, other qualifications. But then it comes back to what I said about friends. I'm a midwife. And you know, sometimes you're looking after a mom, baby, babies come, you know, even at the last few minutes or so you're about to go off. But I had a very good friend. They had so rest in peace. I lost a couple of years ago. Blossom. I don't say anything without calling the people that have helped me to be where I am. And I said to her, I am going to, uh, you remember I was telling her about uh, uh, law. I've got a place. You know, she said, well done, Kate. That's wonderful. What do you want me to do? I said, all I want is any time that I'm called, that I've got to go for my lectures. And if I had a case in my hand, can you take over? She said, no problem. I do that. These are the type of friends that you need. You don't need a friend who is, who instead of encouraging you, being happy for you, you get those who are envious in a way that is un very unhealthy. We do have competition, but the worst competition is the unhealthy competition. So when you have those type of friends, you keep an arm's length to them because those are not the ones that are going to help you to climb up to where you want to do. And this is what happened. I had very, very good friends who believed in me and I believe in them to support me. Hence, this is why it's so important to have those good friends. Well, I did my I did my law degree. I made friends with the young people. This are the time that I created a very soft spot for the young people. They used to say, oh, Auntie Kate, you know, we left home so as to keep away from parents, but you are the mom that is here. We can't even get away. I say, yes, we have to do studies. And I studied with them. We organized our studies, you know, when we are not a lecture, we go around and do some work together. And yes, at the end of it, I made, I made my tutu, which I am so happy about. And then guess what? I went to talk to my manager yeah, at work to, uh, you know, to look at my profile and up, 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 um, to upgrade my profile. He, I gave her a certificate. She looked at it. She said, hmm, what's this? I say, yes. He said, yours? I say, yes, it's mine. When did you do that? I said, well, part time, you know, you know, she couldn't understand it. In fact, she said to me to come back later. And then I went, when I went back to her, she said to me, guess what I done, Kate? She said, she actually pulled my file to see how many times I've been off sick, how many times I've taken the hospital time to do my studies. But amazingly, one thing is people say touch wood. I am very, very blessed that I've got very, very good health. As I'm talking to you today, two days ago, I spent, I was 72. And that health, good health has maintained that. And that is because I love myself. Self-love is very important. You love yourself. When you love yourself, it brings wonderful people around you. Your aura, the way you feel about yourself is what you give to other people. And that brings people around you. And you make friends, real friends that would always want to be a part of you and be with you and see what you do that made you to progress. When I got my law degree, what do I want to do with it? I said to my, I can't give up midwifery because I love delivering babies. But then within that work, because I worked in the community delivering babies at home as well, the parent that asking me, what do you want? I asked myself, what do I want to do with it? But then I remember that parents and the families are busy. They're always asking me about about um, housing, ask me about uh, health issues, you know, like uh, noisy friends, your uh, neighbors and so forth. And I always got to find, them, find an answer for them from the council. And this is where I thought, hmm, how did these people that are counselors, how did they get there? They'd have war head just like I have. And then I found out that yes, these counselors, they, are, they belong to a political party. And then I need to find out, how do I join political party? This is how I start because sometimes people say, oh, I don't even know how to become a counselor. You have to be in the political party first. And how do you find political parties? All of them, you hear them, you know, uh, Labour Party, independent, um, uh, conservative and so forth. What I did was to go and then sit down and look, look at their policies. What are the policies of each individual, you know, uh, party? that you know that actually i agree with me and gradually i found out oh yes labor party because 
you know, for ethnic minority, I found that they are more lenient to ethnic minority. They think about the, the, those uh, poverty, they think about children, they think about young people, they think about so many things, you know, they're much stronger for me, they're much, you know, in favor for me. So that's how I joined the Labour Party. And another thing, you got to go to the meetings. Meetings is not often, just sometimes it's once a month. And that meetings, what do you do that you listen and you learn? You know, from then onwards, when my friends call me, I'm not at home. Ah, kid, every time you're not at home, you're not at home. All these meetings that you're going, how much do they pay you? Why do we have to equate everything with money? You don't, money is not everything. You know, you can learn so much thing that can impact on the other people. Who baby, those are the ones that are going to make the millions, but they use your skill and your knowledge to do that. And that's what I taught myself. I don't, you know, I don't, they don't pay anything, but I like to go and listen. And that's how I continue going to the meetings. And I remember one day the MP called me, she said, Kate, oh, actually we went on a, a conference and that time John Boateng, you know, one of his a Ghanaian, you know, that's the MP at that time, he said, my MP said, oh, this is our council. I said, no, I'm not a council. He said, yes, you're a council. You actually have been watching you. You do more than others. You see, sometimes when we are doing things, you don't know that somebody's noticing. So that was noticed, you know. And then when I came back, he said, if you don't, you know, if you don't um, uh, uh, want to do it, I will still nominate you. You know, it's self-nomination or we nominate you. I didn't nominate myself. They nominated me to be selected and that's the process. You denominate you, okay, I fill up the forms, then they select you and you know, the world where you know, after they selected you, then you go to be elected. That's when you start to knock at people's doors. It's not a, a straightforward pro, uh, process, but it's a process that when you are doing it, you do need, you know that whatever you get is by merit. It's by merit and you feel fulfilled within you. I felt fulfilled when I was elected first time as a councillor in 2002. I felt fulfilled and I was still working full time and I was still looking after four children. And those four children, when I was studying, I was their role model because they said, mommy's got uh, her certificate, two certificates, and mommy still studying. So how is mommy doing it? So we are going to study as well. So my four children, two boys and two girls, they all carried on and they're all graduates because they were watching mommy doing it. And that's why when I see parents that are, you know, encouraging their young people to do things, I feel so proud. Just like I feel so proud of uh, Favor, who has written a, a teenage in lockdown. The book, you know, I read it. I feel so proud. I feel proud for the parents and I feel proud for her. And what I want is let parents do this. Because we're not just only saying study, but we all need to show them that this is the way you do it. And when they do it, let us recognize that they've done it. Extremely important that we recognize. And that's what I think is very, very important. And I think that has helped me as a mother to bring up my children. And I make sure that I take them out. If you call four of them now, they will say to you, mommy took us there, mommy took us there. And we went there, we went there. I don't know how I did it, but it's the will power. Your will is so important. Your willpower is very important because that is what really push you. Don't ever give up. There's nothing, for me, there's nothing is impossible in life. It's the way you handle it and the way you follow it. That is what is going to help you. And I think that I looked at life and I look at that as a very simple thing. That all I do is as long as I'm breathing, that I can do anything that I want to. But I have to do it with respect with humanity. Humanity is what my mother taught me. My mother was a born leader. And right through all her life, I watched my mother do things and I never see her for one day argue with people or even, you know, throw words. And I picked up from my mother and I thought myself, how did I pick it up? I must say to all of you, my mother breastfed me for four good years. You know, for good years, and she impacted everything that is in her into me. That is, she's kind, she's gentle, she listens, she doesn't talk much. But what we say that she counts her teeth with her tongue, and that is what a person who doesn't talk too much but uses her brain to think. That's what they do, and that's how I picked up and followed my mother's trail. I did that, and I'm quite happy that you know I've done that. I completed my military profession, looking after babies, delivering, you know, delivering them and looking after them 
for 40 years. That's why I gave to national health. And that is so when I look at the work the national health people, national health are doing, and I thought to myself, they worked hard. I've been there. I've been there. I, you know, I got, you know, a long-term award from the, the North Middlesex, but that's not it. It's not the only thing. The only thing is the impact, what you've done for people. And, um, you know, the rest of them being a mayor is twice, you know, male, first time, you know, first African, you know, be a male twice in one, in one, uh, um, um, in one borough, you know, and uh, I've got, you know, things that are very, very dear to me, things like sickle cell and thalassemia. During my mayoral time, we always, uh, um, you know, we always raise funds. I had to raise funds for sickle cell and thalassemia. And I've also used that, you know, to purchase a unit at North Minister's Hospital where they are now using it. And I am still working with them because I'm very, very particular about it. You know, sometimes these are, you know, like ethnic minority ailment but nobody is looking at it deeply. But I'm sure that gradually, you know, things, more things, more people are recognizing about sickle cell and we are working towards it. So I think, you know, if you leave me to start talking, I will never finish talking because there's just too much to talk. And I can say that what I'm proud about myself is that during this last mayor, mayoral role, my organization, Catch Them Young, which is improving and teaching the young people, about not only politics, about the things they do. I've used it to make sure that at um, um, at uh, Enfield, Enfield Borough, that I introduce the young mayor. So now Enfield has got the young mayor, deputy young mayor, and the young mayor. And our first young mayor was only 15. And um, if you see how he speaks these days, it's just amazing. And I'm so proud of them. And I'm very, very happy that um, Enfield had allowed me to do this, that is to introduce that into uh, our, our, uh, our borough. And that is just for the young people. Let us love them. Let us teach them what they want to learn. They are our future generation. They are our future leaders. And they are the ones to look after me when I get even older. So we need to empower them. We need to inspire them, impact them, and then help them to reach where they are going. And I'm sure every single person, you know, like he always said, we all got our destiny. Our destiny is in our palm, and every single person can use it. Your skill is there. Everybody's got skill. Nobody has been cheated by God. If anybody that feels that they've been cheated by God, they are the one cheating themselves because God has given every single person what to do, who they're supposed to be, and Hold on to it, grab it, and make the most of it. Because whatever you do, you succeed. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Auntie Kate. Thank you so very much. Um, one of the things I picked up from your um, speech was uh, time management. You've, you've actually done an excellent job at keeping our time. Uh, that was really brilliant. So thank you so very much for that. We're going to quickly move on over to Professor Irima Bell to uh, talk to us about social capital development. Uh, I believe that's the title. Um, but before then, I wish to announce that um, there's going to be a slight tweak to the program because of a new development. So after Professor Bell, uh, where the next speaker is uh, Shazia, she's going, to, um, she's going to talk with us and, then, um, and we'll be able to take a few questions whilst she's with us. And that's because uh, something's come up from her side and she has to leave the, um, she has to leave the seminar once she's done talking. So, um, um, Shazia, if you get ready after Professor Rima, you come, you come on. So, Professor Rima, I'll hand over to you now. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you so much, Auntie Kate. Gosh, now I've got to follow that fantastic introduction. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Um, yes, same thing. Thank you so much for inviting me to address uh, all of you this afternoon. Uh, again, I'm somebody that's, I really do believe in our young people and I'm always willing to share, you know, my knowledge, um, wisdom and experience with, you know, the younger, our younger generation. My name is Erin Mabel and I'm a community peace activist or a community activist. And first of all, I must say to everybody, don't be fooled by the a very strong Mancunian accent. I am a Nigerian born in Britain. So I am a Nigerian 100%. Uh, both my parents are from, well, it's now obvious. We're from Arochukumahafia. That's where we're from. So 
I decided today that yes, I'll talk to you about building social capital in an urban environment. And I know I'm gonna to have to fly through this, so please do keep your questions to the end. But I think it's really important that we understand the social environment that we live in. If we're going to you know, move on, rise up, do what it is that we determine ourselves to do, want to do in this society. Many of you may or may not know that I reside in Manchester. This is a map of Manchester in an area called Mosside. Um, South Manchester, some of you may or may not know, was quite prevalent and quite well known for the gun and gang crime um, of the UK, I would say. And this is a map of Manchester. This map is of, from 2008, so it's not of now. This B area is uh, predominantly Mosside, and this is where most of the uh, non-fatal, fatal, fatal um, gang-related shootings were happening. So a lot of my work, I show this, because a lot of my work now has come out of this, and has been born out of this, because I suppose a bit like Kate, I lived in an area where there was an issue with guns, there was, was an issue with gangs, and um, I lived here. I was born here, I lived here, my children are growing up here. And I was one of the, the few back then that decided we're gonna do something about this. Why? Because it's our neighborhood, we live here. We had many, we did many um, guns amnesties, and this is just an example of weapons that were handed in uh, through the police, but we did, we were one of the ones that called for one of the first gun amnesties in Manchester um, back in the early uh, noughties, and now the police actually do them once every two years. There's quite a lot that we've changed, but one of the things that I've realized through my work, because um, all my work really is around peace and conflict resolution, and what I've realized over the years, over the past 20 or so years, is that basically conflict just is. Wherever we go, whatever we do, there will be conflict. It's always going to be there. For some reason, as humans, we're actually fascinated with conflict and it will always happen. If I was to ask even some of the older ones here, if I was to ask how did we know there was a fight in the school playground, I'm sure we're all going to give the same answer as to how we knew when there was a fight. So what we have to learn to do, instead of avoiding the conflict, we have to learn how to manage the conflict. So wherever you go in life, whether you're at home, at work, in the school playground, at university, at college, you will always come across, across conflict. And sometimes it's not just about walking away from it, because if we just walk away and think, I want to ignore it. When you come back the next day, it's still going to be there. There's lots of different models as to how we manage conflict and think about conflict in a positive way. One of the things that we did, we understood that basically we needed to bring people together. And what if it's gun crime or any other subject, it's about bringing people together and working as a team relying on each other's experiences and we all know that you know that um, term where they say for team there's no I in team we have to work together one of the things we had to do was work with the authorities work with police even though we were from a neighborhood that did not communicate with the police but we realized that we have to if they're going to solve the problem for us they need to work with us we needed to work with them and it's the same in any scenario you can actually pick this model up and place it anywhere else. You need to work as a team. You need to bring people together. You need to bring people together that think like you, that actually think like you and want the same things as you. It's about bringing people together. So how did we do that? It was about forming different networks, different networks of bonding, bridging, linking and identity. And it's, that's called the social capital, building up that social capital. One thing I realized very early on was that there was actually power in people. There's always power in people. And I was able with my organization, Charisma, Community Alliance for Renewal in a South Manchester a uh, area, we were able to galvanize and bring people together for the same said thing, subject, idea, you know, ideology, basically wanting to bring an end to gun crime. So in social capital, I've listed four there that I've identified bonding social capital and bonding social capital can also be about cultural intelligence bonding social capital is when we gravitate towards people that look like us sound like us dress like us you know have the same i don't know hobbies as us that's what we call bonding social capital when you understand the culture of another person or persons we gravitate towards that because it's something that we can identify with and that is okay but sometimes it does cause the phobias 
in other people that are not part of those groups. So even in ourselves, if we're not part of a particular group, we then get a phobia to it. So if we're not part of the young people that are stood on the street corner, we as the elders, not all of us I'm generalizing but we get a phobia where we think what are they up to what are they doing they're up to no good why are they huddled together if we see a group of women that are wearing hijabs and they're all together we immediately think why are they there why are they all talking together so you have to be careful that the bonding can cause phobias Islamophobia homophobia uh, xenophobia and it's usually because we don't belong to that so we fear it the bridging social capital Bridging is where you dare to step outside of your comfort zone. You dare to get to know another set of people, another community, another neighborhood, where we, we go outside. And that could also be having social intelligence, socially understanding what another group of people are about socially going to mix with them socially to find out what are they about trying to understand it and that's why we call it bridging where you'll be introducing your community to another community or your group to another group your workplace to another workplace that bridging you also have the link in social capital and this is where you you know you work with people of a hierarchical in a hierarchical institution for us we did a lot of work with Greater Manchester Police and with local and central government. Um, we did a lot of work with central government. And again, that could be about that social capital, you know, or the social intelligence, sorry, where you understand what those hierarchical institutions are all about, about understanding where the power lies. Is the power actually with them or is that power with us? Trying to understand that socially, again, it's that social intelligence. What is that? How does it work? Then we have identity. Identity is basically who and what you are and being proud of that, owning it. And I'm proud of mine, hence that's why I always start by saying I'm a Nigerian born in Britain. Yes, I have all the titles that I have, but I'm still a Nigerian born in Britain. That's who I am. And no one can take that away from me, but believe it or not, they have tried. People have tried. Why do you um, label yourself as a, you know, a Nigerian? Why do you say that? Are you not proud of being British? Yes, I am proud of being British, you know, but I'm also equally proud of being a Nigerian. And sometimes what we do, we don't understand that by asking certain questions of people, we're actually stripping them of their identity. Saying to somebody, why do you have that accent? Why do you talk with that accent? Why do you dress like that? This is Britain. You know, we're stripping them of their identity and their identity, your identity, is part of who you are. It's very important. And when people start chipping away at your identity, one of the things we need to also understand, it starts chipping away at you emotionally. So therefore, again, it's about understanding that emotional intelligence, that what they're trying to do is break you down emotionally. So if you're aware of that and aware of your emotions and what triggers your emotions, certain things that people say about identity would not um, will not begin to break you down. So that's social capital in one slide, bonding, bridging, linking and identity. And we can also connect all those to the cultural intelligence, to having cultural intelligence, social intelligence and emotional intelligence. But those are a whole other um, conversations and lectures. It's also about supporting each other. But what we very rarely do is challenge internally first. We don't look at what role I've played. I'll go back to our scenario. When we were dealing with gun and gang crime, one of the things that we had to do was to get local people, even ourselves, to actually own the issue, own the problem of gun crime. Challenge ourselves internally first. Many people would say, oh, the police don't care about this area with young people shooting themselves. Government doesn't care. And we had to turn around and say to our local people, well, actually, why should they care? It's our children. It's our children that are doing that. So we should care first. We should challenge ourselves first if we're going to gain the support from outside. So it's, it was about working together for the betterment of the wider community and not just thinking me, 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 I, 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 me and my family, me and mine, I, I, I. This affected everybody. So we had to work as a whole community, neighborhood, community, area. We had to work together if we were gonna solve our issue of gun crime. And don't get me wrong, many a time, 
it was labelled by the Home Secretary, uh, who I've had several meetings with, she then moved on to become Prime Minister, it was labelled as black on black crime, as we know, but we were, one of the things we were advocating and saying was the colour of the hand that pulls the trigger was not always black. It was also um, labelled as a Moss Side issue, a Manchester issue, gun crime was a Manchester issue, whereas one of the things that we were saying as activists was actually it wasn't about us. Gun crime was about the UK. The UK has a problem and still has a problem with gun crime. And this is a country where guns are illegal. So we should be looking at the root causes. How are the weapons getting into the country? They weren't being brought into or smuggled into the country by 14 year olds. So it wasn't about us. We were trying to say to him, it was about everybody. And it, the government did bring gun crime to the top of their agenda, I must say, but it took us six years advocating and being that pressure group for the, um, the government to bring gun crime to the top of their agenda. But one of the things we forced them to do was focus on the real issue. Now the real issue as I've mentioned was where are the guns coming from? How, how are they being smuggled in? We said to the Home Secretary, you start looking at your borders and your ports and you'll find where the guns are coming in from. You cut off the supply, it will cut off the demand. And over the years, the demand did slow down, it did cut down, and you know we managed to influence um, training of police as well. And I can say that gun crime has reduced in Manchester by 92%. But it was about looking at the real issues. Instead of playing the blame game, let's dig a lot deeper and look at the real issues. No young person wakes up in the morning and decides, you know what, I'm gonna get a gun today and I'm gonna go out and cause mayhem, or I'm gonna get a knife and cause mayhem. We said no. It's about looking at the real issues and the situations that surround our young people. What homes are they coming from? What groups are they mixing with? What are the issues that they have? Actually talking with and working with young people instead of talking at them. Because most of the time we talk at young people and we talk about them, but we don't include them in the conversations. And if we don't include them in the conversations, we end up like this um, top picture here where the powers that be, they just take over, they swallow us up. We're all divided like this, we don't come together. But when once we come together, as in the bottom picture, and we're all singing from the same, not only from the same hymn book, but we've all got the same, we're on the same page, then we have power in numbers. And that's what we realize, that we do have power in numbers to actually change things and become that agent of change, those agents of change. We do have the power to do that. We did it, and if we did it, others can do it. And we've been doing it in lots of different areas as well. So about becoming that visible agent of change, it was about networking, mobilizing and advocating networking with different organizations, different people, different groups, mobilizing people together to actually work together to want the same thing, and then advocating on behalf of those people that didn't have a voice, the voiceless. We did a lot of advocating on behalf of young people, and I have been labeled in the past of someone that was agreeing that young people should run around the streets with guns. No, I was not advocating that. I was advocating that why do we blame our young people for absolutely everything that goes wrong in our societies? We blame the young people. Every piece of unwanted behaviour that is displayed by a young person is learnt behaviour. And they learn that from adults, from the older people around them, from the role models allowed around them. That's where they learn all that from. Also, I wanted to show you this because you can change things. I think Kate mentioned as well. Sometimes things are given to you because you never know who's watching. I have a statue in Manchester Town Hall. It's made out of 50 recycled guns, which was a tribute to my work around gun crime. But it's also, it creates a new paradigm in history. It's the first female statue in 150 years to be on display in Manchester Town Hall. 150 years, they have never recognized another woman. And then the second um, uh, paradigm in history is the fact that I am an African woman. I purport to be an African woman. I display it in everything I do. I'm an African woman or, you know, black woman. And three, and I think most importantly, guess what? I'm still alive so I can take photos like this. <laughs> I can take a selfie with my own um, statue. But that's really important. And I like to show this because it is an inspiration for all women and for our younger women. It's an inspiration. It can happen and it, does, it will happen if you want to be that visible agent of change. 
I've created a uh, toolkit, uh, a booklet about thinking of conflict positively, because like I said, there's lots of different tools that we can use to actually manage conflict and manage it properly. But um, I can't go through all of them now. But the one thing I'd like to say to everybody, and especially the young people, never give up. The power to shape the future is yours. So don't ever give up. Thank you. Uh, let me stop sharing. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so very much, Professor Bell there. That was brilliant. We are definitely are focused on stopping gun and knife crimes. And we believe that one of the ways of doing that is by getting the youths off the streets and into employment. I know that in the flyer, we actually said um, employment, but employment there's actually a synonym for uh, getting our youths off the streets and getting them busy, getting them active, positively engaged. And that's what we're trying to do. So whilst we get ready for Shazia, hi Shazia, I believe you're quite ready. Uh, I just want to note that uh, soon after Shazia, we're going to be uh, speaking to our university students that are here, three of them. Um, Success is going to be initially talking to us. Success, can you give us a wave? There you go. And then uh, we also have Fabiana. Can you give us a wave? And then Sharon as well. Lovely, lovely. Very beautiful. There, uh, Sharon and and, um, and Fabiana would come in uh, during the question and answer session. As you can imagine, we do have um, youngsters, youths, you know, who are looking up to people like uh, Success, Fabiana, and Charles who want to be in their position. And it'd be nice to share hear their story to find out how they got into where they are, and then hopefully that will inspire people that will be coming um, um, after them. So, with that uh, having been said, um, Charles I'm going to hand the mic over to you now and um, let you do your thing. Oh, sorry, one more thing. Uh, Shazia is going to be talking to us about uh, film production and script writing and incidentally our next seminar in the series of seminars we're going to be having will be about Nollywood and people that might be interested in acting, people that might be interested in building a career in Nollywood. We have a Nollywood director that has um, indicated an interest in partnering with us so we're going to be working with that so if anyone is interested if you have any questions um, well I think after Shazia we'll have a few minutes to uh, take a few questions and then um, perhaps after that at the end, just for um, Shazia, uh, Shazia, because she's going to be leaving us after our presentation. Over to you, Shazia. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much for having me and thank you all for being here to listen to this. We've got very big shoes to follow after our first two speakers, um, so please bear with me. Um, I'm going to show, just start off by showing you a little bit about what our company does. So I work for an independent TV production company called CTBC. We're based in London, at the moment completely officeless because we got rid of our office last year during the the lockdown so in all of our home offices but this is a kind of a short showreel about all the different kind of elements and different areas of media that we do work with so i'll put that on now <laughs> In January 2018, um, I was lying on my bed, getting ready for school that I had the next day, and out of nowhere there was a horrible scream. Um, when I ran upstairs, I opened my brother's room and my mum had just found him after he'd taken his own life. And then I was plunged into weeks and weeks of the most intense grief and the most painful emotion. As soon as I woke up, crust in my eyes, I couldn't even see properly. Instagram. First thing I'll check is Instagram. It just made me realise I'm literally living for an app. I'm not living for myself anymore. This is a school to prison pipeline. Send out of class. Detention. Isolation. Temporary exclusion. Permanent exclusion. Reoffending. Reoffending. Reoffended. I'm Jondra. I really enjoy being outside. And I sometimes find it hard to keep still. My favourite subjects are science and history. Because I want to learn more about animals. But mainly because I love dinosaurs. They were born and raised on their family farms, and the time has come for them to take charge. Three British farmers trying to run three very different family farms. Now they're facing extreme weather. There are lots of cracks in the ground, so it shouldn't be this dry at all. And financial disaster is just one bad season away. The survival isn't guaranteed. <laughs> When it comes to your head, if I say red, 
it has a lot to do with emotions, basically. Striking, it attracts you, it, it stands out. People touched us, they checked whether the dark color of our skin was real. And they found our natural afro-textured hair very interesting. So they'd keep sticking their fingers into my hair. If we're talking about the stereotype of British people, they speak in a really weird, like, posh accent. What is it, Sherlock Holmes, the suit? They live in London. Fish and chips, scones, mm. and nice Sunday rolls. Drinks, tea. Yeah, the England football team and our rubbish is. Cricket. A hijab literally is an Arabic word, uh, meaning curtain or barrier. Um, but for a lot of people, it means lots of different things. A lot of people do see it as the covering of a woman's hair. But the real hijab is meant to be the one that covers your whole body. Did you want to be a boy? Some boy. Why, why do I want to be a girl? Because I'm not. So a very short intro into the work that we do and as you can see from that showreel there's four areas kind of main areas that cgpc deals with that's working with digital content a lot of that is stuff that's um educational resources so we do a lot of work for bbc um bite size and bbc teach and across the board kind of red cross charities whatnot just giving um i guess a voice to the unheard i want to say we tell lots of different stories and that's really the key that's what we're interested in we also have a radio department who works across making podcasts and audio um, kind of programs. There's obviously TV production as well. So we work with anything from Discovery to MTV to TLC to BBC. That's kind of our main kind of clients. And then we have our own resource called TrueTube. And TrueTube is an educational online platform. And it's for, I guess, kind of secondary school education. And we have about 90,000 schools that subscribe to TrueTube every year and just kind of like watching the content that we produce as a team. I personally work with digital and I'm one of the producers on the team. And I joined CTBC a little under two years ago. And that was uh, kind of after about 10 years of hard graft as a freelancer. And I think my kind of freelancing journey, I, when I left university way back in the, the early 2000s or mid 2000s, I didn't feel like there was a place for me in this industry. So I don't think I ever really tried to kind of enter a proper establishment or a proper production company. And my thing was like, I wanted to make films and I wanted to tell stories and I wanted to show other people how to make films and other people how to tell stories that other people wanted to listen to. But I didn't know how to do that by myself. So my, my kind of way of doing that was to just build connections and little bit by little kind of chip away at people who might be able to like help me in a position to where I am now. And it took, it took 10 years, <laughs> I'm not going to lie, and kind of like with freelancing, there are some years that are really fruitful and, with, and there are some years that are not fruitful at all. So there were ups and downs on my journey. There was kind of institutionalised racism. I, kind of, I don't like using the word institutionalised racism, but there was because I'm, I'm first of all female and then I'm Asian and I'm Muslim and all three parts of those identity I felt like weren't accepted. And I joined CTBC and it's been incredible it's been it's been a journey it's been like even more hard graft I think than, than when I was a freelancer because I'm working as a producer for digital so it's working across different different content and working for TrueTube and making films but that really kind of inspired but also are really important to me as well and recently one of our projects has been for BBC Teach and that this is how kind of our relationship with, with Canuck started so we got in touch with them to help us with casting and we've just finished delivering on Friday like 10 short films about Black British history for BBC Teach, which are going to be shown to 7 to 11 year olds in primary schools to show that Black people do have a place in British history and like the stuff that you read in the books and the stuff that you see on kind of whenever they roll out a TV for you to watch anything about history related, it's not just white people. And it's like, it's that, that's the stuff that I want to be doing and it's been incredible and it's been amazing and it's been hard work, but it's been so, so, so good. So because we are trying to tell stories of different communities, this felt like a really good opportunity to try to kind of, I guess, meet some new people and like tell you guys that we, we are interested. We're interested in working with young people and people of all ages and different communities and different backgrounds and different socioeconomic backgrounds and trying to tell you that there shouldn't be a barrier if there are things that you want to do in the media industry and that's, if possible, we are people that can help. We're, we're an industry that can help you. So 
I'm going to move on quickly. It's so just a little bit about me and a little bit about CTPC. So one of the other things, as well as being a producer of a digital team, I'm also a course leader. And that's possibly the most exciting part of my job. So as a course leader, I'm responsible for delivering training to 16 to 19 year olds as part of the BFI courses that we run. But it's not just for 16 to 19 year olds. There is stuff that we do outside of the BFI. But more specifically, I'll tell you about the BFI because it's stuff that's kind of very prevalent and very like on at the moment. So we run four courses a year. So we run two courses that are part of the Network Academy. Actually, I will share my screen with you because I do have um, a link for you guys. Here we go. So BFI runs courses for 16 to 25 year olds. More specifically, we run the courses for 16 to 19 year olds. And these are the short courses. So they run between, for our company, for CTBC, we run a course from September to December. So one based in London and one based in Hull. At the moment, I mean, obviously with, with the pandemic, we, it was 100% online last year, but normally it is in person. And the aim is that it's 20 young people who don't have to have any skills in filmmaking if they don't want to. They just need to come with an interest and with a passion in filmmaking. And the courses are, they, we do charge, or BFI charges 25 pounds per person. But the, the, the thing that we're really, really, really keen on saying is that there are no barriers. So if for any reason you feel like you need a bursary or like there are reasons why that's the fee you can't pay, like we cover it on, on your behalf in that instance. So that's just something just to bear in mind. Like don't ever feel like the cost of a course that we run is gonna put you off because there are always circumstances in which we'll just say like, don't worry about it, just come on board and we'll cover you and we'll help you if anything like with travel and food and everything else. So 16 to 19 year olds, two courses from September to December. We provide you with masterclasses with people in the industry. They're really good ways to build connections because everyone that we invite in has got an interest in also working with young people and young people give such a new level of inspiration and a new level of creativity that like we don't have anymore as like people who've been in the industry for a while. So everybody's really interested in working with people who just have something new to offer or have something to offer full stop. So it's a really good way. You obviously you get um you, you get to make a film that can go on your profile or on your show reel. You we also do something called an arts award as well. So you can get an accreditation for a silver arts award at the end of the course as well, which helps with, I believe it helps with UCAS points for university, which is which is great. And then the two courses that we that we offer is almost a follow-up but you don't have to have done the short course to attend it is one of the specialist courses and we run two at ctbc one is documentary which is just finished but we've got one upcoming in the summer and that's the script writing course if i change my screen can you see that bfi film academy specialist courses yes okay so at the moment we've just finished a documentary course which was 100 percent online this year and we're recruiting for our specialist screenwriting course. So what I will do is I'll put links up in chat for you guys. I've got um, the link to the actual job form that you can use to apply. But the specialist course for screenwriter, screenwriting course, we're going to be taking in 40 young people aged 16 to 19 years old. We're trying to kind of tick, not tick, we're trying to hit every area of the UK. So we want people from far and wide to be coming to London to do this course. And there, it's going to be a blended course. It starts off with a residential for a weekend where you get to meet like everybody else who's on the course. You get to meet your film tutors or your specialist kind of screenwriter tutors that you'll be working with really closely. And you also get to meet masterclass specialists in person as well. So people who have like done screenwriting as a career for a long time, who've won awards, who've received various accolades and that's all done in person. And then there's a six week break where you go off and you work on your scripts. And that's with regular check-ins with your and then the, the, you come back at the end and your script is actually performed on stage by, by actors or actresses. And you get to, you receive a small kind of a video of, of your script being performed. So that's something really very real and very tangible that you can take away with you um, after the course. And it's something that you hopefully is almost a bit of a stepping stone into the industry. But the reason why I'm bringing up the BFI film courses is because we've had people who have attended previous courses and we've taken them in as like on as staff at CTVC. So we had this a lovely person who came in a course about three years ago and she joined us for about 18 months and she's actually just gone off to university. So there are there are positions to be filled and there are definitely places available within CTVC from the young people that we do meet on these courses. So for any of you who do have an interest in 
film, screenwriting, documentary making, any form of media, CTBC is a good place to kind of start and get in touch with us and hopefully we can be of help. And I'm going to stop there and just see if there is anybody who does want to ask any questions. Thank you guys. Okay, thank you very much Shazia for that uh, brilliant presentation. I, um, in the beginning I thought I was in a cinema watching a movie or something. <laughs> <laughs> That's how good it was. Uh, so Shazia is going to be with us for another five minutes, everyone. So if any anyone here has got a question for her specifically, please ask them now. Um, otherwise, the other thing we can do is uh, collect the questions at the end of, um, perhaps during the Q&A session. And uh, I'm going to share, um, Shazia, if you could, you could share your contact details here. I'm yeah, also going to share, okay, lovely. Yeah. I'm also going to share um, Pat and Kanuk's contact details as well. So if you send your questions to us, we'll compile them and then send them to various speakers and then hopefully um, get answers back to you. So anyone's got, uh, has anyone got a question for Shazia? Uh, please just unmute yourself and speak because um, trying to uh, see Jin V here. Um, just as a quick note, on, in chat, I've just put up two links. I'll put up a link for the specialist course, which we're recruiting for. And the second link is the actual application. It's a job form link because I don't think it's for some reason it's not being linked up on on the BFI website. So that's there if you do want to have a look. Okay, thanks, Roger. Thank you for that. Anyone ask? Does anybody have a question? Uh, whilst we're waiting for a question, uh, in the meantime, uh, success. If you uh, start getting ready, I'll come to you in a few minutes. So, Tony, did you have a question? Yeah, sorry, Henry. Yes, I didn't know whether my I always, I'm, I always mute myself. I'm classic at doing that. So, so just to say good afternoon, everyone. And I'll be talking in a minute. It's very inspiring. Shazda, can, can we talk separately? Because I love what you're doing. I think it's fantastic. And I'd love to talk to you about doing some work with some unemployed young people as well in different areas about promoting what you're doing. I, I think it's fantastic. Your story is inspiring. So probably if we talk separately, that, that would be great. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, I'll put my contact details here as well, she forgot about that. Yeah. Just ask so, Tony, I know, I know that your session is coming later. Could you just uh, briefly, in a few lines, just tell everybody who you are so that they understand how, how powerful you actually are? <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. Well, my name is Tony Highland. I, I do work as a government advisor. I work, I lead on employment and skills, and I, I've been there probably far too long, and a number of people have said, but I, I do advise our Minister, Secretary of State on a, a wide range of things. Kickstart I'll talk about in a moment. But I'm also interested in this forum because I also work with the, some young Nigerian writers. I published a book with a Nigerian poet last year who's wonderful. So I'm an artist as well. I'm a writer as well. But I'm happy to, to talk about sort of government stuff and what we're doing as well. So, Awesome. Thank you, Donnie. Can I ask just a simple question? Just okay, yeah. go ahead, Auntie Kate. Okay, I just want to oh, Sasha, that is fantastic. You know, I really feel great. I wish I was that young. I've <laughs> always liked uh, liked fame in the media. I just want to know how are you funded? We are funded by somebody called the Rank Foundation. They're kind of our parent company. Actually, this, that's a really good question, um, Kate. The reason why I bring up Rank Foundation is Rank Foundation every year. Um, provide an internship for people from any kind of like background or whatever else but they're, they're really interested in getting young people into training and so there's there have been quite a few people who've come through our industry or through CTBC directly from Rank Foundation and that means that they fund your salary for a year and they'll help with like accommodation if you do need to move into London for example because that's where we're based or where the company is based and it's not just um, trying to get you into media it's trying to get you into kind of any industry so just look into that. I don't know 100% about it because like, I, I feel like even though I've been here for two years, I'm still quite new into like the understandings of how CTBC work. Yeah. But I know that they, I know previous people who've come through Rank Foundation and they've like landed with like year long placements and then the company takes them on after because they've, they've all, always been incredible. But yeah, it's the, it's the Rank Foundation. Thank you. No worries. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm quite mindful of time. So that's, that's uh, all, all the questions we're gonna take for now. But like I said, uh, yeah, if, you want, if anyone's got a question about how to get into training programs uh, within um, uh, media, um, video production, script writing, or anything that Shazia has uh, just talked about, all the links are in the chat room. And um, if you're not sure which one to get to, just perhaps uh, contact me via Pat's email address, contactspack at gmail.com, or via Kanuk's email address, which is info 
at canukonline.com. Thank you very much, Shazia. We'll be getting back to you, and then um, we're going to make sure that I'll bring you back when we do the next uh, the next seminar uh, around, in and around um, Nollywood and, and stuff like that. So thank you so very much. Okay, uh, moving ahead. Um, success, are you, are you there? Are you ready for us? I'm going to give you the mic now. So success is uh, one of our brilliant students in uh, Cambridge, studying a very, very powerful course. Of course, I actually wanted to study when I was much younger, but um, due to circumstances, and I had to change my career and uh, when I had to study accounting. So Sotis is going to be talking to us about um, how he got into Cambridge, his life about Cambridge and whatever else he wants to talk to us about. I'm hoping that uh, both uh, Sotis and Fabiana and Sharon, uh, who will come on later, will be able to inspire others uh, who are younger than them and who want to be where they are. So Sotis, over to you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure to kind of speak uh, at this event. Um, and yeah, hopefully I'll have something that's quite useful to say. Uh, let's see if I can share my screen. Cool. Um, yeah, so this is just going to be a little, like a talk about like my academic journey so far. Um, a little bit about me. I um, I come from like Manchester as well. Um, so you probably all just talking about my accent. Um, I live in Gorton. Um, I went to school in a place called Portugal. Which is quite far away by train so the commute in the morning was a bit difficult but yeah I'm currently 20 years old and I am a second year medical student at Gerson College Cambridge I'm also a Christian um, and uh, a little bit about like the place I come from Gorton it's you know very much inner city Manchester um, and so like in general in that kind of area um, academic progression like progressions like higher education isn't as high as it really should be um, it's relatively deprived in that kind of like progression to like higher standings and so I've been quite fortunate to kind of be in the position that I am today. Um, with reference to uh, my, my school, um, I went to a grammar school, Ocean Grammar School for Boys, um, and I went to that school for seven years from like year seven to year 13 um, and the commute was, was long because I used to wake up at 5.30 a.m. Um, and this isn't to like, this isn't to like um, show, oh yeah, I, you know, I went through all this, I've got all this difficulty, blah, blah, blah. But it's to show that like, from like quite a relatively young age, I figured out like the game I was playing in that, um, when, I, when, I, when I say game, I mean, one thing I've noticed, I guess, from like the little time I've been you know, around is that people play different games in terms of what they want to achieve. So I want to play the academic game and you know, I want to go to a good school, I want to go to a good university, I want to, you know, become a doctor, such, such a thing. Other people might want to play like a, like a business game. So, you know, they might drop out school early, they might start a business, such a thing. And um, I, I think personally, it doesn't really matter what game you're playing as long as you kind of optimize for that game. So I wanted to play the academic game. I wanted to do really well in my studies. I wanted to go to a good university. Um, and so to get to that end, I needed to go to like a good high school to get my teaching and all that kind of stuff. So I had to wake up at 5.30 a.m., you know, for like seven years straight to go and get that education. And that's just what I needed to do to get to the position that I wanted to be in, right? We thank God that I'm in that position right now. So I guess to kind of keep, I guess to just kind of summarize a bit from the introduction is to keep the concept of like games in, in, in your head, because the reality from what I've seen is that like, you know, as long as you know what quote unquote game that you're playing, you can make decisions um, in your life that will optimize for that game. Um, and will get you to the position that you want to be in. So yeah, moving on to my um, my my story of how I got into Cambridge. So I was uh, initially a physical natural sciences. That was a, that's business. Yeah, I applied for that that course at Cambridge. Um, and the reason I actually applied for this and not medicine initially was because my parents wanted me to do medicine from <laughs> as long as I can remember. And so my default response was to just immediately reject everything to do with medicine. I, want, I don't want to hear anything about it at all. Um, I applied for school natural sciences and that was that. <laughs> and I got offers. Um, but in my year 13, April of year 13, um, we had we like quite a, an event around the spoke to me and uh, we had the passing away of a very close family friend. And that helped me kind of reevaluate my life choices and try and like figure out again the kind of game I wanted to play. I decided I want to play like the medicine game. So I want to go to, I want to go to uni, I want to study medicine. So I rejected my offers um, from my good universities uh, for physical natural sciences. And I decided I'm going to focus on my A-levels. And then the week after my A-levels finish, I'm going to 
focus on this medical application. And this is already going to be a bit difficult because um, I had three months to kind of prepare for this entire thing, whereas people have been doing this for like a year. So, you know, I was already at a disadvantage, um, but I decided that's what I was going to do. Uh, and, and yeah, it ended up working out. So um, the entrance exams and interviews passed and I know I got the exemptions on January 14th. And I spent quite a lot of time like reflecting on that year that I, uh, that, that I had. Um, and I've, I've like, kind of thought about a few takeaways um, that I learned personally about myself. So firstly, that like setbacks and painful experiences can serve as a catalyst to grow. Um, of course, I'd give you know, nearly anything to have you know, the person who passed away back in our lives, but her passing helped me to kind of grow as a person um, and kind of set me on the path that I am on right now. And although it's painful, of course, it's still painful now to remember that person, um, I'm grateful that, you know, this is a situation that I'm in um, at the moment. And so I'm not saying that every painful experience that you have will have a very, you know, an obvious benefit, but I like to think of any disappointment, any setback as character building, right? So you're facing this, this difficulty right now, but, you know, in the future, because you face this right now, you'll be better equipped to deal with, you know, further difficulties and further challenges that will, that will come about. So that was the first thing that I learned. I also learned that having a clear goal and solid motivation can make all the difference. Um, because like I said, I had three months to do what people would do in, in a year's time. Um, so I needed to work extra hard. And having that motivation that, you know, on the 15th of October, I'm going to sit this exam. I need to focus up because this is, this is literally it. Um, that, that really helped as motivation. Um, and I think that's something that people can really benefit from, having detailed, clear, motiva uh, clear goals rather deadlines, that kind of stuff, um, to really help motivate yourself. Uh, because it's difficult to internally motivate yourself. And when you've got external factors there that can help as an extra source of motivation, I think it's very useful. Uh, another thing I, um, I learned was that the people that you surround yourself by are going to really like determine a lot of the things that you, that you do in life. Um, there's this quote, I can't remember who, who said it, but it, it is that you're the average of your five closest friends. Um, and so you really need to, I guess, pick and choose who you kind of surround yourself by. With reference to me, I already had friends who, you know, were in my year of school, but who had gone to university already. And so kind of knew already um, what you had to do to get there and what you had to be there. And uh, without them, I don't think there's any way that I would have been able to, you know, do as well as I did. Um, and so it's very important to kind of recognize, you know, the kind of people that you want to be around. Um, and yeah. And the, uh, the final thing, that I, uh, that I learned is that this all kind of ties back into this idea of, of, of games. Um, I wanted to play the academic game. I decided I want to play the medical student game. So I put all of my time, all of my, you know, my effort into just that, um, just that field, into, into academics. And now I'm at university and I've realized that, you know, academics is not, uh, academics are great and all, of course I love academics, right? but it's not, that's not all there is to life. Um, and so, I decided, you know, I want to, you know, do, become a YouTuber and that's, that's my YouTube channel and I may want to play guitar and all this kind of stuff. Um, so I've decided that, you know, pure academics, that's not the game that I want to play. You know, I want to device for my interests. I want to maybe be, be an educator, that kind of thing. But what's important isn't the specific details of what I'm doing. For me, what's important is that I've recognized what I want to be doing. And now the decisions and actions that I take will be focused at getting me to that place that I want to be in. That's the, that's the goal. So um, a little bit about one of my inspirations. And is this man here. This man is uh, he's, he's, he's called David Goggins. Um, he's an American ultramarathon runner, um, an ultra distance cyclist, a triathlete, public speaker and author. Um, he's also a retired United States Navy SEAL and he served in the Iraq war. He has competed in over 60 endurance races and is placed third in this, this trial called the Backwater 135 Death Valley, which is considered to be the world's toughest foot race. Um, he also holds the Guinness World Record for the most amount of pull-ups done in 24 hours, completing 4,030 pull-ups in just 17 hours. And he's considered by many people to be the toughest man alive. Um, but the thing is, David was not always like this. If you look in the, uh, in the background, this is what David used to look like. Um, you know, he used to weigh nearly 150 kilograms. He had you know, an abusive father, a single mother, he was bullied, all that kind of stuff. And so... When I read this book, it was like, how on earth did, you know, this person here become this person who is considered by most people to be, you know, the toughest man alive? Like, it's crazy. Um, and what I learned from this book was that it's really all about your mentality. 
and how you how you look at things. The mentality of this man here is nothing at all like the mentality of, of, of this man here. You know, I mean, uh, we'll talk a bit more about it, but very quickly, I want to I want to go about um, go and talk a little bit about the, some of the quotes in this book, and I want to exp like expand a little bit about that. But I think they're extremely important, um, and you know, they're quite long, so I will kind of paraphrase. But this 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 top quote as well is the one that I uh, I took the most from. It says, you're in danger of living a life so comfortable and soft that you would die without ever realizing your true potential. And uh, basically, this just means that comfort is the enemy of progress. If you don't push yourself, you're never going to achieve your potential. Um, and relating this back to, you know, how David was here, you know, he could have stayed, you know, 150 kilograms, not really doing anything with lives. But like he had that mentality change, that, that mindset shift. I was like, no, no, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to change myself. Right. He put himself in an uncomfortable situation. And it was only by putting himself in that uncomfortable situation that he was able to realize his potential. And right now, you know, he's, he's a motivational speaker, uh, speaker, all this kind of stuff. None of it would have been possible if he decided to live life in comfort. Um, and the second quote, I'll paraphrase again. And it just basically means that um, there's no substitute for hard work and there's no such thing as a life hack. So although sometimes, you know, quick fixes may lead to temporary success, you don't learn and you don't grow from those experiences. And um, obsession, passion, talent, all of these things are secondary to hard work. So we've seen two things here from the book. Number one, mentality is everything. And number two, hard work is everything. Regardless of talent, regardless of your obsession, regardless of your interests, you know, hard work is what you need. Um, and that's something I really like take to heart. At Cambridge here, you know, you're surrounded by some literally, you know, the smartest kids in the country, right? And hard, talent is, is only going to get you so far. Myself personally, I don't think I am naturally, you know, the smartest person here, right? But I do well in my exam, I do well relative to the year group, not because I've got, you know, that ingenious brain or anything like that, but because I realized the game I was playing, the academic game, so I know what I wanted to achieve, and I put in the hard work, right? And that's, I think, that's what I think is the most important thing, um, and that's what this quote uh, kind of says, and that's why it speaks to me. And this third one, this third quote here, um, basically says that things are not always going to work out for you. Um, and just because something looks good and you've imagined these things working out for you doesn't mean that it will. Um, when I applied physical natural sciences, I thought, okay, this is perfect. You know, physical natural science at Cambridge University, I'm going to graduate after three years. I'm going to become, you know, go into finance, go into a bank, blah, blah, blah. That was that, right? And that just, that's, just not how, that's just not how it worked out. And that's okay. Um, what I learned from that is that when things don't work out, you don't get disappointed. You don't get, you know, put down. You recognize that, okay, this was a setback, right? It's, char it's character building. You know, there's always a positive, even if it's not immediately obvious. Um, this, specifically, this, this, this line here, your entitled mind is dead weight. People think that just because, you know, I've, I've worked on something, you know, I've, I've worked so hard, et cetera, that means that I deserve this thing, right? Fair enough. But life doesn't always work like that. And life will not just always give you what you think you want. Your entitled mind is just going to hold you back, right? So recognize when things are not working out and recognize that, okay, it's a setback, it's a disappointment. However, I can learn from this. I can bounce back. I can do better. Um, and yeah, that's why, that's, those are the three main um, things I took from, from David Gomez's book. I would definitely recommend uh, everybody here to, to check out because I think it's, it's amazing. Um, very quickly, I was, I, was taught to, I was taught to talk a little bit about some of the issues I'm facing at Cambridge, um, just to show that, you know, life isn't perfect and um, there's no way that I am where I want to be. There's still, there's still definitely progress to be, uh, to be made. Number one, imposter syndrome. And I think that, you know, if you asked uh, Fabiana uh, and, and Sharon, they'll, they'll tell you that everybody at Cambridge is going to say this one. You know, who am I to be here among, you know, all the smart, smart kids and all this kind of stuff. And I feel like I'm out of place. I don't feel like I belong, all this kind of stuff. And that's really, that's really amplified by the fact that, you know, we're black. You know, the, the fact of the matter is, although we are absolutely good enough to be in the positions that we are in, we are isolated just because we're just, you know, because of the color of our skin. I'm not saying racism, although there is, of course, an issue, you know, discussion to be had there. But just the fact that there are simply just less of us there makes isolation, loneliness, and particularly mental health issues, you know, particularly prevalent, um, I think, at a place like Cambridge and especially in ethnic communities. 
I think that's an issue that you know that needs to be discussed more, um, and one that I'm I'm trying to uh, make I guess more more obvious um, when speaking to people. Um, and finally, mentality. Um, although of course you know I just sat here and I've preached that mentality is everything, um, and that you know without mentality you're nothing, etc. 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 Um, but the thing is, there are days where you, you know you just don't want to do anything. You just want to laze around and what are your while your life away, and that's okay because everyone has those days. Um, but it's really about recognizing that that's what you're feeling like, and actively making the decision not to do that. It's very easy to live life, I guess, passively, letting things happen to you. Um, but from what I've seen, and I mean, I'm, again, I'm by no means you know some wise sage or anything. I'm only twenty years old. But from what I've seen, um, you need to be actively going out and doing things. Um, you can't let things happen to you. You have to go and, you know, get them for yourself. Um, so, yeah, those are, you know, some just some issues, I guess, that I'm, I'm facing right now, as I was asked to share. And finally, um, a little bit about my future. Uh, before I went into Cambridge, I was always, you know, trying to, uh, I guess my, my, my focus was on neurology, like neurosurgery, that kind of stuff. So if I'm going to go into, you know, medicine, which I think is a plan, um, that might be potentially something. I do have a YouTube channel as well, and I um, enjoy educating. Um, so that again is something that I think I will end up doing in the future. And, and charity work. Um, I already had a you know a, a, quite an experience with charity work over my gap year. I was fortunate enough to work with a charity that was helping to combat knife crime in uh, in Liverpool, and I was able to like you know go over to Newcastle and we had a conversation to talk about that kind of stuff. So I think that's something that's also going to be in my future. Um, and yeah, if anyone has any questions, um, feel free to ask. Uh, and yeah, thank you so much for inviting me to speak. That was brilliant. Thank you so very much, uh, Success. That was really good. Um, Looks like an airplane. So we're going to hear from uh, Sharon and uh, Fabiana later. Uh, but the next speaker will be Dr. But before we go on to Dr. Cook, I'd like to remind us that uh, Success, Sharon, and Fabiana were actually on a BBC program. And uh, that program is called uh, Being Black in Cambridge. That program is still on iPlayer, but if you want to watch it now or today, or if you want to find it easily, I actually added a link to the URL to the video uh, on the events page, with, um, which I'm posting right now on the chat room. So if you click on that link and you scroll down to the video section, you see um, that video. Very, very brilliant. Okay, uh, having said that, I'd like to remind us again that um, at the end of the uh, presentation, we'll have general Q&A sessions. So please, if you have any questions, just make a note of them now and then we'll come back to question and answers later. But with that having been said, I'm going to hand the mic over to Dr. Koka. Are you there, Dr. Koka? There you go, brilliant. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. I think I've enjoyed the presentation so far. And I will say um, I've got a slide prepared. And um, Councillor Adnolue talked to some of the things on my slide. And um, Professor Enrima also spoke to some of the things on my slide. And I was thinking I was just going to talk about this last bit, which has not been covered. Then success came in and covered that last bit. So I think my job is done, but nevertheless, I'll just want to review what I have on my slides as a sort of roundup. What is this? What do I say you have to know? <laughs> it, it, it's just going to be a, a, a summary of what the speakers before me have said. So um, yeah, that's it. I hope you can see my screen now. Can you? So it's on skills and career development. That's what I want to talk about. And um, we're talking about getting our young people into fruitful and productive engagement. When you speak to many young people today, they want to succeed. But some of them think um, well, it's only through sport. I'm just going to you know, be the next Ronaldo and all the rest. Yeah, I'm not against that. It's one way, but I'm um, building a successful career. I'm looking at it as a route to success. And we've seen examples of that. I enjoyed the presentation by Councillor Anulwe. 
We've seen through hard work, um, she's been able to build a successful career for herself. Yeah, so my presentation is tied to career and skills development. And I just wanna be sure you're following me. Can you see my next slide, which is on benefits of building a successful career. Is that right? Yeah, okay. So um, we talked about some of the benefits. Um, it's just about creating an impact, contributing to society, improving your productivity. So it means we have options open to us, but it's important to pick a line and be best at it. Instead of moving from one area to the other, pick an area of interest and build a career around it. Um, this means you can enhance your productivity, um, build your personal and professional network. Those are some of the benefits and we see a few of the strands coming in through that. Uh, we see how that can lead to a sense of self-esteem. Um, yeah, we see a lot of that in some of the presentation already made and serving as a role model for others. People want to see how you got there, learn from you, follow your footpath and they can achieve possibly the same result. And going through this, we see the health and health benefits of this. A fulfilling career can contribute to life expectancy. And at the end of it, if you follow this through and everything work out for you, I hope this translates to success. The definition of success differs, but I like uh, the presentation that came uh, where Councillor Arnold says, success is not just about making all the money you can make. Success is about the fulfillment that you are able to, to, to um, contribute your own part to the development of society. It translates into good health, fulfillment, increased self-esteem, but of course, financial success will likely follow if you're able to um, build this for yourself. So what do you need to build a successful career? And I've just broken it down into two broad areas. You need the skills and you need certain attributes. Sometimes people emphasize on the skill sets, which is good, it's basic. Um, if you're choosing a particular career, whether you want to be a surgeon like success, you've got to go to the medical school and acquire the basic skills. If you want to be a nurse, like um, Cancelor and Lue, you go to the nursing school, get the basic skills. And if you want to be an accountant like myself, of course, you've got to go to the business school, acquire the basic skills. You need other skills, quantitative skills, communication skills. Digital skills is becoming extremely more important. I like the presentation from Shazia. We've got a, long, a lot of young people now that we're trying to put through that. You need to improve your digital skills because of the way the, work, the world operates now. Um, so much for skills. How do I acquire the skills I need to build a profession in my chosen area? Of course, education is basic. Most people know these roots, um, like success and the other young people here. Set a goal for yourself, get into a good university or college, acquire the basic skills. But that's as far as basic education will take you. You only get the basic skills. So, success, you want to be a good neurosurgeon, it doesn't end with leaving medical schools. There are further training you need to go through. And of course, it could be formal, it could be on the job, and it could be apprenticeships. There are many professions where apprenticeship is a good route to enter. In my own profession, in the accounting profession, you have two main roads to the profession. You go through the formal education, or you go straight through apprenticeship. Both routes lead you exactly to the same place, but formal education will never be sufficient. It's got to be backed up with lifelong training on the job, informal training, apprenticeships. That is that. It looks to me that is a more straightforward part of it. And if I go to the next bit of what you need to complement 
the basic training to build a good and successful career. Then we talk about attributes. I focus just on four. You can continue building this list to 20 if you want. But very important in this is critical thinking ability, problem solving skills and good judgment. At the end of the day, every career or profession or whatever you do is about solving problems. And the situation you're going to come across in life, they are never going to be the situation the same that you've learned from your basic education and training. Even when you do on the job training, apprenticeships, new situations will evolve. So to be successful, you need to develop your ability for critical thinking, problem solving, and most importantly, you need good judgment in whatever you do in your profession, every day on your desk, situation will come that require your judgment. The sort of judgment you make can make the difference between a successful career or a not so successful one. Initiative, drive, motivation. I see that come through beautifully from all the presentation. I don't think we can go anywhere if you don't have the drive to succeed. If you don't have the determination, if you don't have the motivation, we have to develop and build that. And of course, team working from Professor Erima's presentation that came across, what we can achieve by working as a team. And for you to be able to work as a team, it's, it's um, not as easy as everyone says, it. oh yeah, I'm a good team worker. Yeah, I can work in a team. You need a lot of skills to go with that, interpersonal skills. How do you get on with people? It's a skill that can complement your career. Active listening skills. I, I like um, what Councillor Agnoli mentioned about being trained in active listening. Many people don't um, know this is a skill. Sometimes yesterday I was in the office, a problem came up, I could easily get on and have a 15 minutes chat with somebody. But I thought to myself, if you start a conversation with this person, her opening statement will be 45 minutes. I didn't have 45 minutes. So I had to abandon that idea. You need to listen more than you speak. It's just so important. And the ability to work as a team means you need those interpersonal skills. You need active listening skills. You need a sort of empathy. It's not only about your own viewpoint. If you are in a meeting and you speak all through, please go and reflect. You just need to listen to what other people are saying. And it's not just about listening. You need to understand their ideas and, and you need to carefully consider it before you shoot it down. So those are the skills that are, you need to complement the basic skills to make, to build a successful career. And then this last bit is a part I thought I will just pick about and move on. Perseverance, resilience. See, most of these attributes in formal education, we are not being taught. They don't cover them much. Some try to some extent, maybe to teach you a bit of critical thinking, problem solving kind of skills. They can teach you some teamwork, put you into groups, go and work together and solve these problems. But they only go that far right few will teach you the attributes of perseverance resilience when things don't go your way how do you deal with it that's why i'm happy um success touched on that sometimes in life things won't go your way not because you haven't done something right it's not your fault it's not just going to work you've gone to school you've acquired all the basic education You've gone to flying school. You are one of the best trained pilots. You've got all the attributes we're talking about and you've reached the top of your profession. A pandemic broke. The whole world is grounded. Pilots are no longer needed. How do you deal with that? How do you bounce back? How do you rebuild from a situation of disaster or, um, when things are not just going right. Um, I think we need to teach young people all of this. And the narratives that it's out there most of the time, 
is that if you're hardworking, if you do all the right stuff, it's all going to work out beautifully and you'll be okay. Most of the time, yes. But most of the time, or some of the time, not because of anyone's fault, some things don't go right. And the ability to build that resilience and say, okay, um, yeah, I can come off this. I can rebuild. I can, you know, do something else. I think it's a skill we need to teach our young people. And for parents, I think we need to speak to our young people about this. We should develop the ability to cope with this. And then, so how do I develop this attitude or the attribute for success? Knowing that formal education is not going to cover this um, extensively. Well, there is a role for parents here. There is a role for um, friends, network, coaching, mentoring. They are mindfulness training where you specifically go into such training and um, yeah, you develop your own ability to deal with situations like that. So it all comes through program of personal development. Um, so how, what are the opportunities available, especially to young people um, who are just starting off? Some of them have acquired basic training or education, but not all of them are as lucky as success, you know, not all of them are in Cambridge or um, some, maybe there may be one issue or the other, and even that basic education uh, still needs to be worked on. How can they rebuild from there? Uh, and that's where we need to support people generally. Um, there are various forms of scholarships and grants, government schemes. I'll skip the first two. I know um, the other young people or the other speakers may want to touch on them. I want to talk about the area I know, which is the third one, which is what some charitable organizations are doing. Um, Professor Arima has told us about the initiatives she's working on. I very much like that. I, I like the idea of conflict resolution being applied at the um, yeah, community level. I've worked with charities that apply conflict resolution more on a global level, working in the Middle East, conflict zones, but I haven't really gone into the idea of applying it at community level, which is something I've talked about. So I'm very much fascinated about your presentation in that area. So how can we support young people um, to think about career, to build a successful career for themselves, or how do they get started? Some have good basic education. They started on the right path, like some of our colleagues here. Um, some haven't. I will speak a little bit about what the charity I um, support. I'm a trustee with Damilola Taylor Trust, and some of the things we've done in the past um, and what we're doing now or we'll be doing in the future. Uh, we had a program we ran for about 15 years. It's the Extended Medical Degree Program. It's to help people who are not as privileged as success to get into, the med into medical training. So these are not people who have got top grades and they can just walk into the medical school. We created a partnership with King's College to create an alternative route for people. Maybe they have problem with one subject or the other and um, yeah, and that worked. Now the King's College has taken over that partnership entirely, and there is a route for people who may not have the perfect result, but you can create a channel for them to go through. Many of the people, the beneficiary of this program have been mostly from our community. We have some of them as senior GPs in uh, the NHS at the moment. Because of the success of that program, uh, we thought about creating a similar or replicating something like that for people who want to work in the city. And um, I think the convener was part of uh, the initiative when we designed these and um, we tried to get young people to go into accounting and business. And uh, that was a success. Uh, we partnered with a financial institution called Lysis and um, they promised to create internships in their office for the young people who have shown the aptitude uh, to pursue a career in financial services. 
And through that program, uh, we ran it for three years before the pandemic broke. Uh, we got some young people to benefit from that. The star, uh, the most striking beneficiary of that was just a guy who's gone through university. He has a degree, but no job. He was working in a car, uh, car wash. And then he heard about this program and said, let me give it a try. He came on that. Now he works in the city, in the financial institution. Um, yeah, on the path to success. Uh, last year, just before the pandemic, we did one. It's called Career Search and Skills Development Program. We partnered with the co-op and they created apprenticeships for those who have gone through the process. What are we looking for? Not the basic education now, but the attitude from the young people to be ready for the workplace. And um, so we have the next one coming up, which I'm also opening to people here, those who have young ones, you know somebody, you think, um, yeah, they need to, to get into a career or into work. Um, we have this program, which is called um, Change Career Search and Skills Development Program. We're going to run it from May to September. And it's a series of workshops, not to teach basic skills on how to become uh, a surgeon or what. We focus more on the um, attributes, how to boost your self-confidence resilience and mental toughness training, the kind of mindset you need to develop if you want to work in the city, if you want to um, go into a formal environment. And we support them with um, peer coaching, you know, um, how to write your CV, interview, presentation, how to sell yourself, how to network and all the rest. So, um, Included in that is a digital training session. That package itself, um, if you go for just the digital training with the partner we work with, it costs a thousand pounds. It's just part of the component of this and we're offering it to the young people for how much? Free. So um, yeah, so if you know any young person who might benefit, I'll leave um, the contact there, please signpost them. Sometimes um, because something is free, people don't fully appreciate the value. I, I, I like the presentation by Shazia on how they are, the, the training they are giving for people who are interested in going into the media. We, we do stuff like that. We partner with um, organizations like that. Sometimes we procure them and provide it for young people free. Um, so um, those are the words I want to get out there. But thank you everyone. I've enjoyed the presentation so far and I think they are all beautiful. I've got something to learn from every presentation. That was brilliant. Thank you, Dr. Koka. Thank you, Damilola Taylor. And um, moving very swiftly and also being mindful of the time, I'm going to invite um, Chuka Diobi from the Office of National Statistics. He's going to be talking to us about the census and why it's important for uh, youth in our communities to get involved and what the impact of that might be in the future. Um, so I'll just quickly hand over to, to you, Chuka. And thank you for coming. You're muted, Chuka. Thank you. Um, just uh, in a second, let me, um, I'll get my presentation up. Um, uh, what I want to just briefly talk about is one of the building blocks to the society that we belong to and um, its importance to us generally as people. And then for the younger generation, because when we talk about this, we tend to think um, it adds no value to my life. You know, there's a future coming um, and what we do now has an impact 10 years later. Let me uh, just a second, sorry, okay. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Okay, thank you. Um, so my presentation is quite quickly just going to look at what's the census, what's in it for me. What's in it for me, um, like I said, on the basis of when you're a young person, 
what impact does it have um, to you? It's, the census is quite simply a 10 year thing. Uh, it's su a survey that happens once every 10 years. Now, if you think about this, the next time we'll have another census legally by law, you'll be 10 years older, um, hopefully 10 years wiser and hopefully 10 years better than you were now. Uh, so that's why it's something that is critical. We kind of tend to think that we'll always, uh, we'll always patch things up, you know, it's gonna be okay. He asks questions that are very intrusive, what you do, where you are, how much money you uh, tend to make, you know, the construct of your demography, especially for black uh, and the people of, uh, that are classed as ethnic minority. It's very critical because we believe there's a lot of injustice with how equity is being managed in the country. But we cannot, you see, if you're not part of the building block, you cannot write what you see to be an injustice. Um, it helps to build a detailed snapshot of the society. That's what the intent is. The next one, forgive my slide for saying is happening, has already started on the 21st of March. Um, a lot of people would have gotten codes and things to help them complete it. If you haven't, try and get involved. Why? Because if you're not counted, you don't count. You know, um, um, for me, for when, we, when I look at this forum, for a young person uh, who really, really is looking at the future 10 years from now, if you're not counted, if you're not part of the demography being looked at, the resources will not be allocated with you in mind. You know, uh, when we talk about resources, there's, there's so much, you know, policy that is made, that is geared towards you. Now, when I look at the statistics of the country, the last census was done in 2011, said we were 53 million. Out of that 53 million, about 60% are classed to be around the age bracket of uh, from 15 to about 50, you know, considered to be young to getting old, getting along in age. So as we are now, so you're, we're looking at the fact now that you're still getting about that 55 to 60% of the UK population are considered to be young and actively mobile. And then what impact does that have? If the resources are not allocated in the wrong way, on the right way, what will happen is that there's a tendency to be fixated on the older generation because then quote unquote, it's an older pool of people you have to look after uh, than having to now grow this timber that we need to carry things on. Again, I talked about monitoring equality, very critical. Now, th there are things that, that occasionally we also overlook. You know, there they, they are key things like, you know, how housing, you know, long-term transport. Now think about Crossrail. It, it, it's taking how long to even build. Now, if, the government was not looking at how housing, how, the, how people move, uh, the mobility of the demography that make up the UK, uh, especially within the Southeast area, is Crossrail would not have been something that's planned that's taking this long to come through. And then across many political handovers and takeovers and things like that. So how do we start now? The building bedrock of this whole thing is the census. If we don't participate, we don't count. That's, that's, let's just be honest about that. There's so many concerns that we have. Where's the document? Where's the information being used? What's it being used for? I don't feel represented. The only way you can feel represented is if you participate. You know, if you need support, there's, I always tweet about it. It's out there. There's tons of support. But the, the critical thing is that the thing that people tend to be afraid of is what is the information going to be used for? Primarily, it is going to be used to actually make plans, plans that would involve you and your future. In my local borough of Pearl Fillington, I've looked at the fact that their budget for 2021, you know, it talks about um, a lot of cuts that are going to come. And in the sector for youth and everything, there's going to be a cut of about, I think, 18% uh, of what they had last year. Now, why, why is this so? Because they believe that they have um, a huge amount, a huge number of the people who live in Hillingdon are in the aging population bracket, you know, people who are in their early 60s and going on. And so what do they want to do? The resources now will be allocated more towards looking after them than having to ensure that the youth get out of uh, school and get straight into employment. How can you change it? By participating in the census. 
the census is hard fact. That's what the council is used to actually get things to work. You know, um, I wouldn't want to just, you know, overlabor the fact, but there are so many aspects of daily life where this affects us, you know, aside from the funding, even jobs, how jobs are created. You know, the, um, a lot of businesses look at um, the census as a means of how they shape themselves. I, I can tell you um, the, the big uh, construction company, one of them uh, actually set up a scholarship for uh, black uh, students in Imperial College based on the results of the census. And now, they, like I said, again, funding for youth groups and youth activities is based on the census. The census for this year, I think, will be available and in use a year or two from now. And so for, for, for anybody who consider themselves as part of the active youth who want to change things, you want to be counted. You want the percentages to be representative. I, I'm not, I don't have anything against the very young or the very old. But I, I, I have a thing for equity in how things are done. Uh, I've spoken about this in forums that even have to do with black people and the fact that everybody tends to shy away. It's going to be another 10 years. Like I said, 10 years down the line, you're going to look back and you think, why didn't I even actively participate in things like this? You know, hopefully it won't be 10 years too late. You know, the maps would have been drawn and you know how things work. If it is not drawn right, it gets, starts getting entrenched. If there's, um, I, had, I had a presentation with someone, uh, with a group, I think it was in Watford, when they say 5%, less than 5% of, um, of the city, of the people who live in Watford are actually black. Um, and <laughs> it uh, erased the, the number of people. And what, what, what was it that happened? They found out that when they made a case for equality and things, the census said, oh yeah, less than 5% of the people here are actually you know, are black. So you wouldn't be wanting to do projects and putting, pumping in money to support 5%. You give them more than 5% of the budget. That doesn't make any sense. But then you see, it, this is because in 2011, probably less than 5% of the population that actually participated were black. And it's the same message I always want people to actually learn. It has an impact. It has an impact. Forget what anybody is telling you. It is the only hard fact that the government has to be able to work. So my encouragement to every young person out there is you don't want them cutting funds that will affect you. Please get involved. Go out there. It's, we still have time. I mean, by the fourth, I think by early May, the, the website will go down. There's fines and all sorts of things. But think more about what impact it will have. I didn't want to go through a lot of statistics about how unemployment uh, has the rise in unemployment and the effect of, um, of, of businesses and COVID-19 and the long-term impact and government intervention. Government intervention will be driven by the census. It will not be driven by any other thing. So if they go there and they look and they see, oh yeah, it's 10% of the people are within the media, the bracket of 24 to 40. Uh, let's look at the other ones. They will now will have an impact that will drip down to them. I mean, while this is skewed, it's not the right skew. Uh, so let, let, let us really, really think about this and go out there. If you haven't, please get convinced and convince people around you. I know it might sound like this is, this is, but this is one of the key building blocks of the society that we belong to. If we do not get involved um, as young people, as old people, as all, anybody across the demography, there will be inequality in how there's distribution of resources. Um, now, again, on the other hand, I also want to encourage a lot more of young people to get involved in the organizations that run these things. There, is, um, there are things that I wouldn't want to really, really touch on, but when we, I, I know a number of the speakers talked about things that had to do with racism and thing, in places where they went to and there was not adequate representation of people of uh, similar like, like them. I, I would want to encourage, you know, like the ONS, for example, if you, if you feel like you want to work in statistics, please get involved. It's an organization that is bereft of people um, who are from the uh, black and minority um, community. And they, they are so keen to have you come on board. 
because then also that helps with bringing ideas that will shape the way uh, this, um, how do I say it, these kind of campaigns are run. You know, please, um, I, I wouldn't want to say much again, but please be encouraged. The census is for everybody. But more importantly, think about yourself as a young person. And 10 years from now, would you want the results of government policies and everything, the things that are representative of your group of people? Like I said, 60% of the UK population is classed to be between 24 and 59, actually, or rather 16 and 59. And 50% is actually up to 49, you know, uh, 15 to 49. So think about it, there's a huge band that, that actually would be considered to be young and very mobile and people who the sense will represent and then resources will be rightfully allocated to things that matter to them. Um, that's all I wanted to talk about. Thank you, thank you for listening. Thank you so very much, uh, Chuka. That was um, very brilliant. Our next speaker is going to be uh, Tony Highland. Tony is a senior national account manager for the Department for Works and Pensions. That will give you an idea of, of as to the width and the breadth of his tentacles and how big and how wide they are. Uh, even though Tony is going to be speaking to us about the youth, I'm sure that the governments also have programs for adults as well. So thank you again, Chuka. That was a very powerful one. And um, to every young person here and, and uh, anyone here that knows young people, please do encourage them to, to participate in the census. Uh, the future belongs to them. And as the young people are asking them now, uh, just imagine where you, you would be in 10 years time and um, ask yourself where you would like to be in 10 years time. It, it, that journey to get to where you want to be in 10 years time starts now. And if the government is planning for your future, it's important that you get engaged and get your friends to be, uh, to engage with that process as well. So thanks again, um, uh, Chuka. Uh, without further ado, I'll hand the mic over to um, Mr. Tony Highland. Thank you very much for coming, Tony, thank you. Hi, Henry. I'm just conscious of your time. I know it's nearly six o'clock. So do you, are you going to carry on? Yes, yeah, we're going to carry on now because the, the Q&A sessions will come in after. And um, obviously that's an open-ended session. But the most important thing is for everyone here to be able to hear what the speakers have to say. Then we'll then go on to the Q&A session. So please um, no, that, you have your 15, 20 minutes to um, talk to us, please. Thank you. No, that's fine. Yeah, I am happy to talk. Yeah, just as I explained briefly, my name is Tony Highland. I work for the Department of Work and Pensions. I'm a senior national account manager. I've worked in government for around 30 years, actually. And uh, just to sort of start off with, I'm very much from a working class background, Irish parents. I grew up in Hackney. I was educated, uh, or self-educated, really. I went through the university system. I ended up starting as an advisor in a local job centre, and I've done every conceivable job for DWP over a number of years. And I'm also a mentor, uh, a mentor for the National Mentoring Consortium. I have supported a number of mentors over the years. And as I said before, I'm, I'm also in the arts as, as a writer, but what I'll do, I'll concentrate on DWP and our services for, for young people. And it's interesting talking about the economy. We know youth unemployment, 800,000 young people unemployed at the moment. It's three or four times what it was in the past six or seven months. We know it's a particularly acute time for, for young people. End of furlough may well present us more problems and issues with more young people actually being unemployed. So we are looking at supporting us as, as best we can in terms of programs. I'll feature on Kickstart. If we do have any young people that are actually um, on, on the line at the moment, that are in receipt of universal credit, are actually in, in the system. The Kickstart program is designed to support young people into employment. It's really engaging employers and partners in terms of getting them to offer six month opportunities, paid opportunities, we subsidize that, we'll pay 25 hours a week. And it's across all sectors. So if you are a young person that is finding it difficult to find work, talk to your work coach uh, about those opportunities. We also have something called sector-based work academies, whereby we're working with large numbers of employers to actually get young people in to work. Just, uh, it's interesting because I really enjoyed all the sessions. I think they've been fantastic. And a lot of my work is, is around youth unemployment. And whether you're a graduate or whether you're a young person that's still trying to find your way, there's three or four key things to me. Branding is the first one, even for graduates and students. So I, I've in, interviewed, I've mentored 
unemployed graduates from all communities over a number of years and often it's about that branding what are they about what are you trying to do what have you got to say what are you looking to do in terms of career what are you really about as a human being cvs mask that we know cvs don't actually provide that sort of a uh, idea of what you're like as a human being so a lot of my work is really about how we support and and brand people it's interesting because if you're a young person you're applying for one of our jobs uh i will always look at your facebook status i'll look at your instagram status i'll look at your linkedin status i'll look at twitter i'll look at everything to find out more about you now employers are doing that if you're a graduate or anyone employers are doing it and quite rightly because you can tell a lot about someone from their social media status as well. So I think a lot of it is about how you are presenting yourself to the world, because the world is seeing that and employers and partners are seeing that as well. So it's just something I'd, I'd sort of share. If I was actually going to um, talk to any young people about the future, and the, I, I talk about the growth sectors. In Cabinet Office Government at the moment, we're doing a piece of work looking at the growth sectors in terms of opportunities. I cover construction for DWP. I lead on construction. You wouldn't know if I asked you how many jobs there were in the con construction sector. I don't think anyone would know, but it's more than 150. And there's a wide range of sales jobs, marketing jobs, bid writing jobs, HR jobs, graduate opportunities galore across construction as well there is huge scope for a whole range of careers at entry level as well manufacturing is the second sector that we're looking at we're expecting manufacturing to go up we're always making things in one way or another haulage logistics driving jobs i know it sounds ridiculous but the haulage and logistic sectors you think of your poor your poor old amazon driver that's actually going up and down the country doing things there are graduate opportunities with amazon that are fantastic really really superb the next area the fourth one is social health and care as you can imagine you know and it's interesting listening to um Aunt katie earlier talking about the um the whole health sector the work that goes on the fantastic work that goes on it's really trying to bring awareness of those opportunities to young people and make them more attractive as well the last one which would be no surprise is is it it social media digital we know it's huge in our kickstart opportunities in particular we're trying to focus on bringing in a large number of opportunities of people like microsoft google uh, founder vine is a young uh, self-startup organization i work with as well but a wide range of opportunities that young people will find attractive but i would also say if you are a graduate and you're thinking about careers look at those sort of sectors to go into i've supported i, I remember supporting a young history graduate unemployed girl in west london i got her a work experience placement with balfour Beatty, the construction company in victoria in a hr department she rang me about six or seven months later said tony i'm going to australia balfour beat a huge multinational construction company they offered her a post in australia because they're a huge company there are contracts there housing and she's actually just decamped and gone to develop a great career working in Australia in construction for Balfour. But just an example of someone that would never have known that was possible, but it's possible. I'd also talk about government careers. One of the big things for us, and obviously it's a, it's a remnant of Brexit, clearly, leaving the European community has huge implications for us. But in, in a way, and let's always look at the positive, government departments, we are expanding rapidly. So certainly if you're a graduate, I consider the fast track, fast dream, apprenticeships, internships, but not just that. On direct gov, if you're, we, we just recruited nine and a half thousand work coaches. We're looking to go up to 15,000. We have jobs on the go on a very regular basis. So careers in government are good careers. I would say that, wouldn't I? Because obviously I, I am where I am. But I do think that there are great opportunities for young people in the public sector as well. So I would certainly be thinking along those lines. So we also work with organisations like Youth Employment UK, which are very good. If you're a graduate, I'd think about Bright Network. Who I work with as a partner organization. They are excellent at looking at placements and work experience opportunities across all sectors for young people. The youth group as well, Jack Parsons and the youth group are excellent. They've got a youth ambassador 
program where they actually get people engaged. The beauty of what they do as well, they get some really good, significant, prominent employers involved and supporting that and their range placements, etc. So the youth agenda is hugely important for us. And in each location, and uh, I'm not going to say that we always get these things right. You know, I, I'm ne never an apologist for everything, but I remember working in Tottenham when we set up New Deal for Communities with David Lammy, the MP there, who, who's, who's a good man, a good soul, and we tried to do some good stuff in Tottenham and uh, in different areas, the Wolf and Forest as well and whatever. But um, it is about the local links. It is about finding out who you can talk to. If you're young and unemployed in areas where I've grown up, like Hackney and Islington and whatever, yeah, I know there's a perception probably about working with DWP, working with the job centres. And often we get, I think the idea of us being a benefit police as well, because we obviously pay benefit and whatever comes through. And no matter what we do, people will always see us as that villain that's stopping someone's money somewhere along the line. And I get that. Hey, I, 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 I get that. But I also think we do have advisors now, troubled family advisors, ex-offender advisors. We're doing a lot of work with... Um, young youth groups around the gang culture as well. Our work coaches are reaching out, trying to support young people. Think about it logically. You know, we need to reduce the reliance on the public spend in terms of benefit money and whatever. We want to be supporting young people as best we can into work. It's really interesting because hearing about Manchester, I've done bits of work in Man Manchester as well. And, you know, the huge issues around, you know, gun crime and the perception of, of, of young people. I've worked with a large number of ex-offenders over the years and young people who were in gangs. And, um, it, it, it is about presenting the right opportunity in the right way, with the right mentor, with the right influence, to be able to offer that hand-holding support and say, you can do this and provide that. And I think, you know, we, we're doing what we can in, in that space. So there's a huge amount going on with our, our work. I personally have a, a passion about supporting People, I set up the Care Leavers Employer Covenant for DWP and I lead on Care Leavers for DWP and we engaged employers and partners 250 plus to offer opportunities for young people coming out of care because for me there was a huge gap there and that's gone fantastically well. We run a Care Leaver internship program across, across government where each year and we can't get enough applicants which is staggering for me. We took on 100 25 I think this year across all government departments we've done that over the last three or four years a large number go into our uh, posts permanently as a result uh, as a result of the pandemic the issue of domestic abuse has become more prevalent sadly and I've helped develop the employer domestic abuse covenant the edact where we're supporting victims of domestic abuse and use the same care leaver model where we've got employers and partners that are standing up to to look to support to see how we we can offer that sort of help because i'm a firm believer that sustainable employment is the answer in a large number of cases to supporting a young person get where they want to be there's no two ways about that sustainable employment that's meaningful that's going to last them and they can see a career at the end of that and there's there's mentoring involved as well so um as i say i'm conscious of your time i could go on all night about anything and everything that i i do i have a real passion about what we do i'm not an apologist as i say we don't always get it right where we work with community organizations and where we get those partnerships right we do a load of work in that space but i would think about what I've mentioned around the growth sectors, I'd mention, I'd think about public sector and because I think we are in growth and um, it's not just DWP, other departments are recruiting, but and construction as well, social media, there's a large amount of things going on. I'm not gonna put a, we don't know what the end of furlough will bring. We suspect young people will be adversely affected by the end of furlough, especially within retail, hospitality, 
and catering, given the nature of those jobs anyway. We don't know how the retail sector is going to react post the 16th of April. We don't know how it's going to react over the next couple of months, whether sales will increase, whether people will be still still going into those shops, whether people maybe like me, I, you know, my, my daughter taught me how to probably do this a while ago is shop online and buy things that I never thought I'd get online, which I am doing now. Hey, that's the way of the world, isn't it? You know, but so we don't know how things are going to work out. So with kickstart opportunities, we're aiming at 250,000 by the end of December for young people to actually have something that they can go into if they really need that help and support. And that will be structured, mentored support, hopefully into a sustainable job. And just, it's interesting in the, in the arts, I'm fascinated by the idea of the arts and social media and for young people as well. And self-employment is a real uh, biggie for us now, looking at how we work with some really young dynamic organizations that are business startups and looking at supporting young people that quite rightly in this day and age of the virtual world and social media maybe want to set themselves up in business and do their own thing in that space so there's a large amount we're doing in that space i am quite I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. If anyone wants to find me, it's probably the best way to get me. I'll always answer on LinkedIn. I'm quite happy to help and support in a, any way, but I'll stop there, Henry. Lovely, lovely, lovely presentation. Thank you so very much, um, Tony. No problem. Very interesting that Tony ended with, uh, with LinkedIn. One of the first things I did was to um, connect with Tony on LinkedIn and uh, the moment he, he shared one of my posts about this event, you know, the, uh, the uh, viewership of that particular post jumped from like, I think 20 to well over, I think maybe 100, 150 or thereabouts. So uh, LinkedIn is a very powerful tool. And I know that I've spoken to quite a number of young people here and I've encouraged them to, um, to set up their LinkedIn profiles and, and mm -hmm. make it uh, user-friendly, particularly the URL. And it, it's important to follow each other as well. I, um, I followed Tony, connected with Tony, I've connected with a number of people here, uh, Fabiana as well, you and I are LinkedIn together, Success Young as well, uh, Sharon and I have spoken about it, Dr. Koka, um, Dr. Boma Douglas, and too many other people here. So LinkedIn is actually quite important. So I would encourage you, I think me and Professor Rima Belia, we followed each other as well, we connected on LinkedIn also. I can see the wonderful things you're doing there. I will encourage um, us to follow each other on LinkedIn. I'm uh, at, at EH Ecoli on LinkedIn, or I put in my name, Henry Ecoli, maybe there's the same thing with Tony as well. So that brings us to the end of the uh, presentation sessions and uh, we're going to quickly move into the Q&A. Um, if anybody wants to go for a quick cup of coffee or whatever, you're free to do that and then come back and join us, please. So uh, I'm going to kickstart the uh, Q&A sessions. And also I want to know that I've seen some very, I think two very interesting questions in the um, chat room. One for Dr. Koka during his presentation and another one I can't quite remember, but we'll get back to them later. And I also want to, uh, I don't know if uh, Councillor Susan is on the call. I know that Councillor Susan runs a youth mentoring uh, program and I did ask her to come and, on and, and talk to us about it during the session. I uh, have our flyers, which I'll share in the chat room in a minute or two. So I'm gonna kick start the um, Q&A session off with uh, one particular question that I've had. And um, that question will go to both uh, Fabiana and uh, Sharon. And it's really about young girls like you uh, who are inspired by your story. Like I said, uh, when I watched your, your BBC program, Being Black in Cambridge, you know, um, some of the things you guys said resonated with me. And I, I made efforts to share it and I sent it to quite a number of people and um, the, the feedback I got was really very impressive. So uh, there are young girls out there who want to be in your shoes right now, okay? And they are particularly interested in knowing how to get there and for them to be able to understand how to do that. They want to hear your story, uh, focusing on the difficulties. What challenges did you have uh, in getting to where you are and how did you navigate those, challenge, those challenges? So I I'll go to uh, Fabiana first and then after Fabiana, um, we'll come to Sharon. Sharon is the president of the Afro-Caribbean Youth, uh, I mean, uh, Students Association, I remember. Correct me when, when it's the time to talk and then please um, tell us also how you got to that position. Fabiana, over to you now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so a bit about my journey to getting to Cambridge. I think I probably have an unconventional story of how I got here. But originally, I really, really, really didn't want to come, actually. And um, obviously, my mom, she's Jamaican. So 
for her maths and English is the golden rule that is what I have to focus on so obviously for her this is a massive deal that I'm here um, but it was always not particularly like a university I wanted to go to I've always known that I have the capabilities to do so because my um, teachers and so on have been really really supportive and such but I think that you know the reputation that follows Cambridge was one that I just didn't really want to be involved with and I thought that I wouldn't fit in or as success talked about in, in, um, imposter syndrome and I just didn't want to be in this sort of environment but then I had some really really supportive um, sick form teachers that really pushed me to apply and so I got to the interview and I was still saying to my mom even if I get in I'm, I'm not coming so you can get your hopes up um, but then I, I got the um, offer and I think that's what kind of switched for me I think I realized that not only do I have the capabilities of getting in but I deserve to be here as well so I think that um, any young women especially especially young black women sometimes we feel like everything is against us and these sorts of environments aren't aren't first of all for women aren't for black people and aren't for people that come from um, a socioeconomic background like I come from, I grew, grew up with not that much money, um, but these sorts of adversities are ones that you can definitely overcome and I think being sure of yourself and your identity is really important for not only the journey of getting here but also when you get here being able to um, stick to your guns and just be yourself and kind of um, well, it's a difficult environment and kind of just being able to root yourself and be successful here as well. So I don't know whether, Sarah, you'd agree. Um, yeah, I kind of, I, have, I think more of a conventional, not, not conventional story in really, but I think it's my kind of narrative into Cambridge or journey into Cambridge is a bit more um, like common. So um, like Fabian, I grew up in a very like working class family um I, came, I moved to this country when I was about four or five um from Eritrea in East Africa um so with my mum and so um with that it was just very much like my mom, it was like even for my mum it was like you're gonna get into uni and like the top one I don't know what it's called I don't know how you're gonna do that but you're just gonna do it so there was always kind of like this distant like it didn't even necessarily have to spell out Cambridge per se but it was always this like somewhere there it's just going to happen um and I'd always been quite kind of like school and education was always my thing I wasn't really good at much else and so I invested a lot of myself into that um and so when stuff like GCSEs came around like that was fine um and then I think sixth form is always that period where you're kind of like okay I know that this is something I want to do but I just don't know how to get there and the school that I went to kind of it's not that they weren't willing to support me but it's not like it, the, the whole going to Oxbridge the whole application process no one really understood it um like I know with for example writing uh, personal statements like Cambridge and Oxford specific ones they want them to be quite academic and I remember my teacher just telling me like no like they want to see that you're a well-rounded person so like scrap all these paragraphs about the books you've read and this like all that just scrap all of that and just say you've done netball and all these things and like if I had done that that wouldn't have gone down very well just because that's not the type of things that you want it's not very tailored like, it's not very tailored towards um like applying to Cambridge and so that I, what I always felt was that I know within myself like to be honest I said like I have the capabilities of doing this and I know that should I be accepted like it's a place that I can thrive in but I always felt that there was this this gap of like how do I go from here to there and not even in a sense of maybe they don't want me or someone like me but it's just physically it's like it's like I want to go to America but I'm like in I don't know like Botswana it's like how do I travel there was no means of doing that um and then what really helped me was kind of finding community and finding loads of networks so I was kind of really blessed to be applying in a time where there was loads of kind of like social mobility and like access initiatives that were happening um that would really help like looking to bridge that gap that I always felt with with you know university life because there was no one I could really speak to about 
was I like to go to university, let alone Cambridge. And so around year 11, year 12, year 13 time, I remember just applying to like loads of different um, things like Target Oxbridge, um, like the LSC programs that they were doing with law, um, the Sutton Trust, do loads of things where they give like students experience to spend like a week at a university, go to lectures, like do social events. Like it was, so having that kind of immersion um, and just being able to reach out to people. I remember, um, like the ACS was mentioned. So even before I got to Cambridge, the ACS, um, the African Caribbean Society in Cambridge was really helpful in setting up like access workshops for year 11s and year 12, just to like, just because they understood what it was like to come from like where we come from and they were really willing to fill that gap. And so even when I got the offer, I was able to go up to Cambridge um, and have like a really nice formal dinner there. And that was set by the ACS. So I think um, for anyone that is interested in applying, First of all, like like what Fabiana said, like believe that you can be there and that there isn't there isn't anyone that can kind of if that is where you are destined to go and that's where you feel like you can go, there's nothing to stop you there. But if you do like me feel that there's kind of gaps or places, things outside of your control that that you feel like might hinder you, don't like don't be afraid to reach out to people there and find community and find networks. It can it's literally a type of just just a quick search on Google and you can find loads of initiatives. It could be DMing people on Instagram um, about, you know, oh, I need help with my personal statement or I need help with this. Like, don't be afraid to create that network outside of your school um, because obviously schools and institutions may have their flaws, but don't let that hinder you and just be open to, to have that kind of interaction. And there's loads of us like myself, Success Fabiana, who are like just here to help. And there's so many other students like that. So, um, just don't don't make sure this isn't a journey that you do by yourself and even if it's finding support from parents and encouragement from parents or from friends like have those positive voices that can keep you going that can keep you steady on the path um and just have be a source of like just in hope and encouragement like i think that's really important it's fantastic thank you very much uh, sharon and fabiana very good input um one one theme i did pick up from what you guys said is um dedication and focus on knowing what you want uh, which is really very good so right now i'm going to throw the floor open uh to anyone that has a question to ask um the one i can remember so far as um dr Koka, there's actually a question for you in the chat room i think it was from uh, was it mr balogo um if you're there please uh, unmute yourself and ask the question i have a question for tony um thank you so much everyone it's so great to be here as a business owner, do I get any incentives for hiring young people under 25? Tony, if you're here, can you answer this question, please? Okay, so be before Tony answers the question, can you uh, introduce yourself again? Come back on, you, yeah, yeah, unmute yourself and then uh, tell us who you are. Hi, everyone. My name is Esther Osakwe. I'm the CEO and founder of Life Improvement Consults. Yes, we are a training a uh, firm we specialize in creating, I like the way you're smiling. <laughs> we specialize in creating programs that help you to be healthier, happier, more relaxed. That's it in a nutshell. I'm a certified trainer and my background is mental health and um, mental resilience. Thank you so much. I hope that's, that's enough. That's sufficient. Yeah, yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Tony, over to you, please. Yeah, I need to be healthier, more, more relaxed on a regular basis. Exactly. So I, I'll be in touch, I think. But um, no, seriously, yeah, you can. If We change the rules on Kickstart now. If you're an employer, you can actually uh, take on someone via Kickstart. You don't have to be. It, initially, before it was for larger employers taking on 30 or more. But we have a three in one ratio. So you can actually take on one person for every three people you employ, if that makes sense. But if you look on direct gov, um, and if actually, if you just wiki kickstart scheme, it's a very simple way of applying for kickstart funding and, and support. So, yeah, you can go in and you can apply directly as an employer. And as I say, you, you can actually uh, advertise to someone for 25 hours a week. We will pay 25 hours a week for six months and you'll get sort of around uh, 1,500 pounds for employer wraparound support as well. So your bid will be assessed based on then we'll do a spotlight check with cabinet office. We'll we'll do a sort of rudimentary check on the business. It's been in existence for more than a year. But yeah, the answer is yes. That's probably the longest ever answer yes to a very simple question. But yeah, it's, it's yes, you can do. But if you have any problems, then come back. But you'll find the kickstart guidance uh, online quite easily. 
Jess, thank you, Tony. No problem. Thank you. Thanks for that, Tony. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, breaking news. You know, we were talking about connecting on LinkedIn earlier. Uh, Micah and I just connected on LinkedIn now. So things working. Let's get connecting. Let's get um, um, socializing and uh, connecting and building that network that we need to help ourselves uh, grow in this environment. So um, welcome more questions from anybody. Just unmute yourself, please, and ask a question. I'm still looking for Mr. Balogun's question on the uh, chat room. But Mr. Balogun, if you're there, I hope I'm getting your name correct. Uh, please unmute yourself and then ask your question. Question, question, question. Yeah, Dr. Okoka, I think the question was about, um, it was about, let's see. We're talking about opportunities for young people, I, th I think he said, and he came up and said, what about opportunities for older people or something like that? Sorry, what I picked up from Pierre, I don't know if I'm right, is about people who don't have financial education uh, or training. Yes, yes, that's right, that's the one, that's the one, yes, yes. Okay, yes, um, let me just say this. Uh, when we talked about getting into a career or a profession, uh, there are some where you have basic education to start with. There are some where you don't necessarily have to have uh, some basic education in that area. You only need the attitude uh, and the mindset to, to learn. Um, when we did the Working in the City program, uh, Career Pathway program, we partnered with Lysis Financial. One of the products they were offering is about, uh, they call it know your customer. And they were bringing in people, young people who are ready to be trained. They offer this training package to the young people, then internship and study them how they were performing in the role. And from there, they were able to offer permanent employment to free people. When it comes to this training, you don't need to be an accountant or a business person. Uh, you could have come from any other background uh, because the training is fresh. It's not what you will normally have gained in your um, university or college education. And there are loads of offers out there in the community where they're just looking for people with the attitude and mindset ready to learn and um, acquire new skills. So um, yeah, that's not a barrier. Thank you, Dr. Koka. Does anyone have any other question by any chance? I'm just trying to flip through the chat room and it's a bit difficult um, from here. Just so much information to grapple with. Is Councillor Susan um, on the conference? I don't know if she's um, jumped in now because she did have something she wanted to say about mentoring. Maybe not. No, I can't see her there. Susan. Okay, she's not here. But anyways, I've shared her flyer um, in the chat room. If anybody's interested in, in picking it up, especially for youth within the community, and even if you don't have any youth, uh, please pick it up and then share it amongst your uh, social groups and then um, hopefully help to spread the word. Like I said in the beginning, the, the purpose of this is not a one-off um, uh, seminar we the, the the overall theme really is to get young people off of streets and into um engage well, engage them positively via employment or getting them into schools getting them into apprenticeships getting them into a mentoring program and then also uh beyond that for people like uh, like fabiana and sharon and success well like in universities there's life after university because um you'd obviously now probably not thinking about paying bills and mortgages and stuff like that but by the time you graduate from university and you get your own place you find that your needs will become much bigger and much broader and so you'll be thinking about um how to generate your own income either via business or uh, getting employed and stuff like that and then uh, so there are routes to help you navigate that um challenge and even for those people that are in, in employment there's something called career management um how do you manage your career how do you keep yourself there how do you get retrained how do you acquire new skills? If you think about it right now, uh, I think for the last two, three years, employment has been going down. Initially, it was because of Brexit and some jobs got shoved off to um, um, Europe 
and then elections happened. And whilst we're recovering from that, we came back on board and the election, the pandemic happened. So really the question is, after all of these uh, stresses have uh, dissipated, we're going to come back to, well, gradually go back to normalcy. And what would that be? What would that be for us? Uh, so many people in our community are not employed. How are we going to be able to get them back to employment? What new skills will be required by new employers? And um, how are we going to be able to help our people to navigate these difficulties and challenges that will help them to get back and then keep them there and then help them to grow in their careers? So we're going to be having a series of seminars um, uh, in and around this theme. And like I said earlier, the next one we're going to be having is around uh, script writing and Nollywood, uh, well, movie production, um, focusing on Nollywood to share people's experiences there. And the key focus of that, that would be to encourage people who might have their own YouTube channels like uh, Success was talking about earlier, and who might need some help or um, guidance in terms of how to build it up and then even make money from it. Um, so yeah, that's really what the whole, uh, what the theme of the entire um, seminar or series of seminars is going to be all about. And um, I don't know, without any other questions from anybody else, um, I think I might say that, uh, yes, it's been a successful um, conference and I'd like to thank everybody that has joined us. And um, I would like, therefore, to um, perhaps bring the deliberations, discussions to a close. Once again, I want to thank everybody that has joined us. And um, if you're willing to stay tuned to continue um, here, that's fine. I'm just going to play some Afrobeat in the background. Uh, to What's up? Women as well, because What's this is International Women's Month. Yeah, any questions for anyone? Question in the chat. Somebody was asking a question to Tony. Second to last chat, I think. Oh, really? Um, Said, uh, it's possible for the person to just speak up because sometimes it's actually a bit difficult navigating through admitting people and... Um, just four up from Flora. Okay, I'm in the chat now. There. I think Tony left. Hello. Um, hello. Good, uh, good evening, everyone. Yeah, good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Christian, uh, Christian Adbai. Um, voice chair, can it? Um, thank you all very much for the, um, the presentations that's been ha that's happened this evening. Absolutely fantastic. Question I have for the uh, students on the forum: um, One of the biggest problems that the stu uh, students have um, is one of the, their biggest fears is the student debt. They're always uh, whenever I speak to students those who have dropped out of university and those who are about to go to university, one of the, their biggest uh, things they are afraid of is the, the student debt. And they, a lot of them can't, you know, imagine it. Can them, I'm just wondering if the students on, on the platform can, can say something um, that may encourage other students, please. Either success or any of the other students can you? Fabiana, are any other student here? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'll go first. That's okay with you guys. Um, yeah, so there's 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 a bunch of like schemes. There's the scholarships. There's um, if you do like a quick Google search, there will be like uh, various schemes that will provide money for disadvantaged students having to get into university. Um, I looked at some of these and I was applying as well, and they're quite useful. Um, so yeah, just like like a quick Google search. Um. And a bit of like, yeah, uh, research, and you can find some some good initiatives. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, Go on. I, I would also add that um, if you think of it less of a debt and more so of an investment, um, it's probably one of the best investments you'll make. University is so so powerful, like higher education, especially for our community. We tend to be so afraid of um, higher education and getting ourselves into these spaces. But it's such a great investment. And as Success said, there's so many options that you can take to support. And then also, I know that Cambridge has like great schemes and stuff like that. So the actual university that you apply to usually will offer up some, some support as well. Um, I just wanted to add as well, practically speaking, like just for university in general, you don't actually start paying back your student loan until like you've, you've earned a certain, I think it's like 21,000, 25,000, like it's a certain threshold where you won't be charged until you've started making that amount. And then as you, you're, they do it by percentage, like by portion of your salary. So like initially pay 10% of the student, put them back and then as you make more, it, you know, um, they do it, they work it out like that. And um, 
it depends on you have to decide I guess your career choice or kind of what you know you want to be in, into so if you know you want to be a doctor obviously university is something that regardless that you have to go into and so um you know the reward of after you know after graduating you get hopefully a good job and then the patient like yeah it will be reasonable but I don't think it's something to put you off completely because if that was the case I'd be like I'd be finished but I think yeah just the support that is available and then even just the way, the way that repayment and stuff is structured like you should be okay. Excellent thank you very much. And can I just add to that um you know thank you so much to the students on you know which are on the screen on board now but exactly what you're saying because I mean I think my children are all more or less the same age or just a little bit older but they've graduated but I remember when they were going into university and they were like oh my gosh mom dad we can't afford all that money and that and I said to them see one quite rightly as you said as an investment in your future you know in your future and I think also secondly because like I said mine have graduated now but the thing is even when you start paying back you know the amount that you pay back is so small you know you hardly even notice it coming out of your salary so it's nothing to worry about at all you know and you're right I think now they've even upped it you've got to be earning over 25 something like that so imagine if you're on like 30 40 50k again the percentage that they actually take out of your salary you wouldn't even notice it i mean you probably spend more down the pub at the end of the week you know so yeah good on you good on you thank you yeah brilliant uh, actually let me add a bit to that as well because um i know that about 15 years ago a friend of mine came down from nigeria we both worked for a bank in nigeria and um came down to study at i think at lsc but he quickly got broke because sometimes you know when you work for a big bank in nigeria and you come out here you'd uh, think you have a lot of money but when you convert your local currency into pounds sterling and then you pay your first rent that was my experience my first first month's rent was equivalent to my one year's rent in nigeria and uh, i quickly got into trouble as well but he had uh, i think his school fees then was about 25 or thirty thousand pounds for one year's master's degree course but he he successfully got a loan from hsbc to uh, to to pay it and then he continued and studied and finished on time but just as it was finishing, he um, actually was able to secure a job at the World Bank, um, who eventually, I think they helped to pay off his debt. And then they uh, paid him about £10,000 or $10,000, I can't remember, to, to um, relocate him from the UK to South Africa, where he was based. And then I paid for him to go to Washington for X number of months, I can't remember, to... Um, to get some training done but because he got that job he was so well paid that the 50 or 30 thousand pounds loan he got was really immaterial uh, i think what like fabiana said is a huge investment into yourself and into your future and if you do it you have a better chance really of navigating troubles that might challenges that might come in the future and then be able to get yourself where you want to be so it should never really be seen as a big burden but as you stepping up, taking up responsibility to um, to to have a control of your future, and then you're doing something about it. Can I just uh, add a little bit? Pardon? Can I just add a little bit? Yes, please. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, just you know, I've been writing on the chat, but I just need to stress uh, my voice to the young people. So so proud of you, and well done. You know, I mean, um, I know that in so many years ago. Our, our, our children always, the teachers are kind of um, pushing them to doing probably social work or something, like, you know, something probably into sports and all that. But at least now, you know, the, the, the young people are kind of uh, speaking out and standing for themselves and knowing exactly what they want to do and they follow it. So well done and they keep up the good work. You know, like we said, you know, once you trust yourself and then Nurture, nurture your mind and heart and soul, you will definitely achieve that which is already been given to you by the Almighty. So well done everybody. And then thank you as well. I take this opportunity to say thank you to Professor Rima. Well done, you know, I love that you, I wish it's my sculpture there, it's fantastic. And you just really, really look just you, you know, whoever commissioned it has done a great job of you because sometimes when they do it, it doesn't resemble that person, but they've done a great job. You know, you. So well, well done. And I must say thank you to uh, Tony, you know, for giving us all those informations with regards to 
obviously uh, the young people job and apprenticeship and so forth. And I'm very sure that um, definitely, you know, there will be more information, you know, about it. And all generally, you know, to Canuck, you know, for, you know, doing this, you know, I mean, Henry has been, you know, I didn't know he has so much plan and that is a great, great plan. Well done, you know, well done to you and the, and haven't seen uh, Dr. Koka for some time. It's so nice to see him there as well. And everybody, if I haven't mentioned your name, please forgive me, but you know, it's, sometimes it's not good to mention him because he missed out some, but then it's important to miss, to say, you know, that which is really sticking in my mind. I wouldn't go without talking to the young people because they are our future, they are our future leaders, and they are, you know, people that we have to depend on. Because if you look at your family, while you bring up your children, you're giving them instructions and everything. Gradually, it turns the other way around. And they are the one asking my daughter, will say, mommy, what are you doing that for? You shouldn't be doing this, you shouldn't be doing that. And I thought to myself, oh gosh, I'm now the one learning. So thank you, too. thank you so much. Well done, thank you everybody. Okay, thank you very much, Auntie Kate. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Engineer Patrick Obidoni, who is the Secretary of the Manchester Community, um, has been very, very helpful in organizing this program, very active and helped to secure some of our speakers. I also want to thank um, Pastor Ayo Adidoni, uh, who runs uh, an organization, a charitable organization called, um, the logo is on the flyer, uh, FAWP. He actually paid for our flyer to be designed. He sourced the designer, he paid for it to be done, and he was very um, active in, in getting things done there. So thank you so very much to him. I would also want to thank um, uh, Chuka, Chuka from uh, the Office for National Statistics uh, about the census, a very, very, very powerful uh, presentation talking about the future and um, we really want our people to participate more in this and, and it's been very, very uh, great pleasure to have you here. And of course, all the speakers, Professor Rima, who has inspired me so much as well in last um, in a month or two, Auntie Kate Ha. Dr. Boma Douglas, you know, we've come a long way through our days in ICANN and uh, we're still here doing it together. Thank you so very much. Uh, Dr. Koka, Dr. Boma Douglas, and our teenagers here. Madam Comfort, I am, was that you there? Uh, is that, is that um, Success's mom? Yes, I am. Oh, okay. I want you to say hello to us. You have a very powerful son. Uh, you know, uh, I, uh, I just really wanted to watch and learn. So, Auntie Kate, thank you for telling me you can do part-time PhD in four years. <laughs> and uh, Professor Rima, thank you for being an inspiration. Now I know I still have a long way to go. And I'm glad. No, it's, I it's, it's, not, it's not PhD. It's the law degree. Yes. Oh uh, yeah, okay. But you, you are just an inspiration. So I've taken quite a lot from all of you and uh, I'm you. encouraged. Thank you. And well done for bringing up. I mean, you know, I always say thank you to parents, you know, because honestly speaking, it's not very easy to bring up children in this country, especially for us, especially for us. Because sometimes parents know whether what their children are worth, but, you know, for some reason, you know, we don't, we're not able to get them there. And when you get them there, honestly, it's hands up for you. So you should also be proud of yourself, you know? And at the same time, you are extremely young. So you've still got lots of things that you can do. Do you know that when I studied for my law degree, I was already almost pushing 50, you know? So really you can do it, you know, anything that you want to do, you can do it. Just like your son said, it's just the mindset, you know? And then just believe, just believe in yourself, trust yourself, and you can achieve. So well done. You know, he's a great asset to you and to us as well. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Like he's, thank you smile. he's loving all of that. <laughs> um, yeah, so thank you also very much. I uh, wanted to invite Dr. Dayo Olomo. Uh, don't know, Doc, if you're available to say one or two things, because I really want to appreciate you for helping to quickly organize the technology that we've uh, used so far. Thank you so much. Um, Doc. I think you're still muted, are you? I'm not. Oh, okay, yeah, you're not, yeah. Okay, go ahead, yes. You see, mentioning names, I never even realized uh, Dr. Dario is there. Oh, Dr. Dario is there, he's been, he's been, a, he's been a very powerful engine to get oh, into God. things. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> very good evening to everybody. I've just been behind the scenes, sorting out the technology and making sure that we do not have any intrude there. I've been very, very inspired by by all the speakers, especially the young ones. Success recommend uh, a book, and I'm just going to buy that book. 
the man you spoke about. And so that's very, very inspirational. And I just want to thank the organizer, Maxi Henry, for putting this together because this is very, very important for us as a community of people, nurturing the youths, preparing them for the future, moving them from unemployment to employment, and also making it possible or making them believe that these things can be done. It is possible. So we have inspiration from the elderly ones. We also have inspiration from the young ones. At the initial stage, I was a little bit afraid and apprehensive that I hope it's not going to be a situation where you're going to bring a lot of old people to talking about their experiences and we will not get experience from young people. And I was happy that we, we have a blend of experience from the elderly ones, the mothers and present. I just want to say there is just something about human beings. We human beings and to the young ones that human beings are incredible people. We can turn nothing to something. We can turn pain into fortune and we can turn adversity to success because you are a unique creature. You have a unique skill, you have a unique talent, you have a unique capacity, you have a unique history, you have a unique DNA, and never in the history of this world has somebody like you been created. It is said that you have a unique DNA, and your DNA carries with ease the wisdom of previous generation. Above all, we all endow with the sense of greatness. You got the power. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Dayo. Uh, I got this music I was playing in the background in the beginning to, especially for all the ladies in the house, because uh, as you all know, it's been an International Women's Month. And